It's a little after 5.30 on May the 5th, 2022, it's hard to believe. Um, this is a regular meeting of the Santa Fe Public Schools Board of Education, and we have all our board members here, including the student board members, um, except for Vice President Garcia, who is excused. So we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and begin, as ever, with the Pledge of Allegiance and salute to the New Mexico flag in English and in Spanish, as well as our acknowledgement of tribal land. Thank you very much. Moving on to our school board showcase. We start with Nava Elementary. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. With us tonight is Assistant Superintendent Kathy Casaps. Board President Noble. Board members of the board and superintendent. It is a great honor to introduce Justin Hunter, principal of NOVA. Board member president, uh, Kate Noble, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, thank you for having me this evening. I appreciate you. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, from the bottom of Nava's heart, um, we appreciate uh, everything that Santa Fe Public Schools has done to support us this school year. It has been uh, a tremendous help uh, to our staff and students, and we just wanted to say thank you for that. That said, uh, this evening I wanted to showcase to you, um, it, Nava, uh, for us, we are reflective pr practitioners in what we do. We believe in the, uh, the power of reflection and what it does for us. Uh, as educators and as students. And uh, without further ado, I have a, a, a video that I'd like to play for you that my staff, students, and a digital learning coach who's amazing, by the way, Shannon Wittenberg, if you haven't heard her, uh, look her up, she's amazing. At NAVA, we have our students doing these uh, portfolios. Um, by sixth grade, we're hoping to have them electronic. And what we believe here at NAVA is that the uh, educational journey is in fact a journey. Um, the students, they come to us at very young ages. They start with uh, the inability to read, uh, recognize letters, things like that. And over the process of time, we want to capture their learning throughout the entire journey that they are going through school. So uh, we have the students starting at uh, their very young age, starting to collect some of their, their uh, artifacts, things that they've created throughout the course of a year, and things that they're proud of that, that demonstrate their learning. Um, we understand at NAVA that, that 
students are more than just test scores. We see them as, as people that we're, we're shaping and molding to be the future, the future of our society. And so um, we see it as a, a growth, or a continuum of sorts that our students are, are along. And uh, what we want to do is honor their learning throughout the years. And so what we look for with our students is to have this, this progression where as they become more and more adept with technology, they start with this physical artifact type thing and uh, over time we get them digitalized. And uh, once, they're, once they're digital, the students work their technology um, to uh, turn those portfolios into Google Sites, things like that, these websites that these students can take with them, not just from the end of elementary, but hopefully to something they could take to middle school and beyond from there. And so that's the idea of our portfolios. Hi, so for kindergarten portfolios, at the end of the year, we include our data binders where the children mark and keep track of their iStation scores and other test scores throughout the year. So we have iStation's reading and iStation's math that they keep track of and this will follow them next year. So that's part of their portfolio process. And the other part of the portfolio process is each project we do in our classroom, such as our human body um, unit. Each piece of work has an explanation of what they've learned for this particular unit. And then at the end of the year, we collect these in a large envelope folder. And the kids keep track of their work in here. And then we present these um, portfolios to their parents at the end of the year for continuation. So that's how kindergarten conducts their portfolios. So at Nava, we really like kids to reflect on their work and to think about what they've learned throughout the year as students, but also as lifelong learners. And so this is what our student portfolios look like. Um, most of them have their fifth grade from last year too, because we started last year. But if you go in, you can see their classes, and then we can go into math, and you can see that Onas has um, assignments, but you can also see that he has his reflection of why he's proud of it. And one of the ones I liked the most was an assignment he didn't even get an A on. He got a B on it. But he was really, really proud of his work because it was the first time that he had done the practice printable all by himself without any collaboration. And he got a 3.5. And in his own words, um, that he had a Eureka moment. And that's the kind of reflection that the e-portfolio allows our students to do. Um, hi, I am Attic Sky, and this is my ePortfolio. Um, and the cool thing about my ePortfolio is that I can show all my work in one place. So I can have like my math assignments in math. And so I can like show anything I've done in math. Or I could go, I could show, yeah, I, and I have my 5th grade e-portfolio and my 6th grade e-portfolio. And I have all of my work and activities, um, I have my grades, I have all sorts of things that I've done over the year. And it's cool because I'll be able to take this next year into whatever middle school I go to. Thank you again for taking the time to let me show you some of the great things that we're doing in our school. It's appreciated. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, moving on to item B on our school board showcase, we have E.J. Martinez, sixth general music, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble. With us tonight is our district music coordinator, April Pickerel. All right, 
have my big font. All right, good <laughs> evening. Thank you for having us. We have two great performances for you tonight. Todd Lyles, please stand up, Todd. He's the music teacher at EJ Martinez, and he has served the district since 2017. Todd loves teaching the K through six students at EJ Martinez. He is so proud of their hard work and dedication to learn this song and perform it for you. Please enjoy this performance of The Lion Sleeps Tonight, arranged by none only than Todd Miles, and performed by the sixth grade music class. Once again, COVID strikes. Um, I was going to have a live performance for you today, but unfortunately, again, COVID struck. But here we go. Maurice Norman is the band director for El Dorado Community School and has served in music education for 35 years and Santa Fe Public Schools for the past four years. His band, sixth through eighth grades, continuously earn superior first division ratings at local and state level contests. This year, they earned the title of the New Mexico Middle School's Band State Champions. I am presenting them with a certificate of recognition of this amazing accomplishment, which I will go take to their classroom. <laughs> but here's their certificate. Yes. <laughs> this is the first band to ever win state, so I'm super duper proud. And I hope you enjoy this performance of Marzo Zinger by Randall Standridge.
thank you for having us. And I do want to say that they were the only middle school in the whole state that made a superior rating. So I'm super proud of them. And if you see them around town, congratulate them. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you very much, Ms. Pickerel. Thanks for bringing that to us. And um, huge congratulations to the El Dorado. It's the middle school band who is the state band champions. Um, that's been uh, going around in the media, social media, and it's really something we're celebrating. Um, and thank you for the um, music from EJ Martinez as well. Just want to also thank uh, Principal George Baca for being here. Nice to see you. <laughs> Um, and thank you for having that music performance brought to us. Okay, moving along to public forum. As ever, we are getting our legs under us on public forum and with multiple different forums here. You can speak in the room, uh, you can call in, or you can send in an email, which Mr. Janarski will read. Um, so we'll see if anybody has signed up, and I will, again, invite anyone who's here who didn't manage to sign up who would like to address the board to speak. So, Mr. Janarski, do we have anyone? Good evening, board president, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. There is no one currently signed up for public forum tonight. Thank you. Does anyone want to speak to the board who's here tonight? Okay. Seeing no urgent hands or motion, we will go ahead and move on to our union update. And President Mayer is here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, school board, uh, superintendent, cabinet. Um, I'm Grace Mayer, I'm the NEA Santa Fe president and a teacher or teacher at Milagro Middle School. Uh, I want to talk about a few topics today and read some uh, policy and um, from our agreement and uh, our school board po policy as well on non-discrimination. But I'll start off with bargaining, a little bargaining update. We're progressing well. We have a session scheduled for Monday. Um, I feel like we're moving forward. However, not sign, um, you know, we have to work on language and that takes time. And so um, we're also, you know, contemplating how to um, pay for the raises that uh, are required, but also how to uh, enhance uh, those tables um, with additional monies and resources and also um, to address uh, the um, the progressive policy of the board which was uh, for the last five years or more to support staff in terms of um, paying for increases to our uh, health insurance premiums and um, other costs. So we look forward to settling on that um, in the next few weeks, hopefully by June. Um, I don't know if uh, Deputy Superintendent Romero thinks that's possible, but let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> um, we're um, in the middle of testing and Unfortunately, I think I've expressed to Deputy Superintendent and the Superintendent, um, the testing is taking away from teaching and learning. And we have been down this road before, and I'm afraid that we are returning back to that day where we are losing weeks out of the year for a process that I think is uh, generally flawed in so many ways. But um, I hope that the district can look at the mandated tests that are required and keep it to a minimum and keep the disruption of actual learning, <laughs> um, you know, to a minimum. I think that uh, we've, as a district, we've um, talked about uh, the joy of learning and bringing that back after years of standardized testing and putting kids in very difficult and challenging positions. Um, as an educator, I'm not um, opposed to my own assessments in my classroom, 
I am opposed to um, hours and hours of the same uh, questions and the materials that are being reviewed. Our students have challenges in reading and math, as you know, and many of our students who are bilingual students are now presented, some of them, with the test in Spanish. But I don't think people realize when they have a four-hour exam, uh, a lot of it is reading. And so the kids are completely exhausted. They're overwhelmed. A lot of them were missing teachers, especially in the secondary level this year, and felt completely in uh, their knowledge of the subject, especially in science and some math classes, because they lacked a permanent teacher and had part-time subs. And some, maybe some of our board members can reflect on that too. They don't feel that they're, um, they were adequately prepared for some of those standardized tests. I think it was premature to start them. And I think that the three assessments that we had going were probably our best bet, and that's all we should have done for this year. But the powers that be uh, do not always listen to the educators in the classroom. And I think that's a matter of also respecting our ability to assess progress for students um, in terms of creating our own assessments. So as a district, I'd like to pick up that torch again. And I know the school board is part of that, trying to reduce as much testing as possible uh, so that our kids can actually enjoy learning and teachers can uh, teach um, the subjects they love and not have to be interrupted by this constant assessment. Because testing is not teaching and it's not learning. It's testing. <laughs> um, let's see. Really excited about the uh, Early Childhood Center getting off the ground and the lottery for our uh, staff members for their students, uh, for their children to be cared for in uh, a safe and welcoming environment that is reasonably priced for them to move forward in their careers at San, uh, Santa Fe Public Schools and really excited that that happened and that we're well on our way as leading the way for hopefully the state to figure out how to do that at every district. But certainly in ours, with the high cost of living um, and the high cost of childcare in our capital city <laughs> um, and around the state and around the country, I think it's um, going to be a huge asset as a recruitment and retention tool for our families. And they can live in the community that they work in, and I think that's really valuable. Their students can attend our schools they can live and work in the community and um, you know, hopefully want to stay for 20 years or more uh, at, until they retire. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's 30, but I, I'll say 20, so it's not so overwhelming for those new folks. Um, okay, so I uh, wanted to discuss um, Article 18, which is non-discrimination, and read it to you. Uh, and I know the board has a non-discrimination um, policy as well, which pretty much is similar. The district shall not discriminate against an employee on the basis of ethnic background, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, sexual orientation, political affiliation, marital status, age, physical or mental disabilities, ancestry, serious medical condition, spousal affiliation, gender identity, veteran status, or membership or non-membership in any employee organization or any other, or, or on any other basis protected by federal, state, and local law, rule, or regulation. The district shall provide a safe, positive work atmosphere free of intimidation, threats, harassment, and retaliation for all its employees. The dis teachers and all other district employees will be treated in a fair and professional manner by district directors, supervisors, principals, and district staff at all times. 
all employees shall have appropriate, consistent administrative support when enforcing student discipline. So the code of conduct that's approved by the board. Um, and I'm reading that because I feel th as if we're getting a lot of concerns from every kind of group that our NEA represents, our secretaries, our, um, our EAs, our educational assistants, our nutrition workers, our transportation department. Because I think there's added stress on administration and some directors to fill vacancies or to figure out who's going to cover different jobs that are uh, vacant, that there's a lot of anxiety about that. That's that's not in line with this policy. There's actions that they're taking that are not in line with this policy. And um, there's, there's often times where principals or uh, other uh, directors or supervisors challenge ADA accommodations. So Americans with Disability Acts uh, accommodations that are approved by our HR department. And they're fully aware that this is federal law and a mandate. However, they make individuals when they are, um, you know, when they, when they have to leave for an appointment or, or uh, there is some other issue uh, in terms of their accommodation where they can't go to an outside duty or some other things, they make those individuals feel th as if there's something um, wrong with that request and as if, as if it wasn't approved and it isn't in place and they make them feel as if um, that health concern uh, is not something that makes them a team player, or it, they oftentimes will humiliate them in, in front of others regarding those issues. And I really would like for that to stop. We have um, in previous years, and including this year, uh, written a few um, grievances about hostile work environments against some principals and some administrators. And unfortunately, it feels as if those allegations that we, or we feel like are documented with emails and other things are not necessarily taken seriously by the HR department. Sometimes folks read out, reach out directly and sometimes folks reach out directly to you. And so oftentimes things are not investigated fully and the resolution for the employee doesn't, it doesn't feel as if they, the resolution by the district is, um, is on, makes sense to the employee. And the, there are a few individuals who this is consistent over the last few years and um, those behaviors don't seem to change. So it doesn't seem as if the district is um, providing them the appropriate um, work guidance or management skills to make their jobs a little uh, maybe less frenzied or hectic. But what's happening is it's resulting in um, our employees not feeling valued by their district. And I know that we have these policies, but we need to be, I think, vigilant on making sure that we're enforcing and that, that there is some accountability to our supervisors and our principals. Many staff have asked for anonymous surveys to be given so that we can rank our administrators or, our, or at least discuss some of the issues and that that information isn't used against us in any way in terms of evaluation. And our staff has asked for that too. Um, we used to have what was called a, like a 360 evaluation, but I don't think staff were sort of included or uh, some of that uh, educators were often asked to uh, evaluate their um, principles and some of that goes out. But the real concern is that um, we are often sort of called out on that. They kind of know who's been saying what, <laughs> and that then becomes an issue for someone. So unless they're very strong-willed or don't feel 
uh, don't fear the retaliation from um, someone, they will not even uh, put in to the survey at all unless it's anonymous. So this is a challenge for us because we're often asked, NEA Santa Fe, to conduct our own surveys about individuals. And I have to say to individuals, well, you need to make a formal complaint with the HR department and maybe follow up with the superintendent to see what we can do. But um, I feel like our, we're held to a certain uh, ethics code. And so, um, but sometimes when our principals violate some of those things or our administrators violate some of that stuff, the same actions aren't taken. Like there's not an investigation. There's not, um, there's not, they're not put on leave or they're not, you know, asked to explain themselves. And then their behaviors don't necessarily correct themselves just on their own. And I know this is a difficult uh, topic to discuss, but I know the board policy is similar to this. And I just think that we need to understand that the working conditions of our employees is critical for them to be retained. It's not just about the, the money, it's about how they're treated and if they're treated fairly and, and with respect. And um, I just hope that as we move forward, we can sort of look at how to embrace uh, our employees and, and, you know, understand their situations when they're happening and not um, demand a certain thing that they can't even uh, move towards. Like, just to give you an example, you know, there are many uh, single parents and other folks that are looking after older parents. They can't stay at events after school. You know, they, they have to be home to care for that person whose caregiver has left for the day who they're paying, right? Or the state provides for a short time. And they, I just feel like, or they have to pick up a child from a daycare center that closes. So they're not gonna be able to stay at a certain function. And I just think we need to say to ourselves, okay, we need to value that person and what they need to do, and we need to re respect the fact that they're gonna do that and put their family first. And that's what we should say to them. Not that you're not a team player or figure out another situation. There's no other situation to figure out or they would have figured it out, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, that's the same thing for our commuters. I mean, there's a, there's a train that leave, lives, leaves at a certain time. There's a bus that leaves at a certain time. You know, that's 4.30. They can't, they got to be on the bus because there's only, I mean, we're in a rural state. There's only one bus leaving. There's only one train leaving. So, you know, to make other arrangements or to tell a worker to do that, is really to them a slap in the face that, that you don't understand what they're dealing with. And so I'm just here to say, we need to figure out how to work those um, situations because we're all struggling. We've all been through a lot. Our mental health is waning. <laughs> we have three weeks left and we're all this like, okay, another day, another day down. But who's counting, right? <laughs> so I just hope moving forward we can, we can again start to address each other as if we're family and understand that, you know, these exceptions need to be made and we shouldn't be pitting other people against each other. You know, uh, if I have an appointment or whatever, I don't need to explain that to my principal if I can't make a meeting or something. I'll try, but I should just send the email. I have an appointment. I'm sorry. I don't need to explain this or that. My principal doesn't, or my supervisor doesn't need to call me on my phone or ask for my personal phone number to tell me that they expected me at a meeting and they're disappointed. And that happens. <laughs> and I, I just think we need to stop that behavior and say, okay, there has to be limits to what, how accessible people are to our job. And that also means emails on the weekends. You know, we don't, we don't work on the weekends. Don't expect me to respond to an email, even though I call the superintendent or Vanessa on, uh, sometimes on Sundays. But uh, I figured they could pick up or not. And sometimes they do. Most of the times they do. But uh, 
you know, th that's not true for employees, like the normal relationship of a worker to their boss. You know, I have a little bit of a different situation. And so I have to make sure, you know, that if something's happening that we can, you know, remedy it. And sometimes there's not enough hours in the day, which we all know. But so I, I just wanted to read that to you, have you reflect on it and hope that we can move forward and again, sort of improve those, that's those situations for everyone in our district. But thank you. Thank you, President Mayor. Good to hear from you. Appreciate what you bring to us. Um, okay. Moving along, we're on Roman numeral six, student board member announcements and updates. Do our student board members have anything to update on or are you just caught up in the whirlwind to the end of the year? <laughs> uh, a bit of both. We've got a few things to touch on from Santa Fe High. Um, AP exams kicked off this week with a relatively smooth start. Um, and uh, follow up on the supercomputing challenge, which was last week. Uh, Angus McGinnis, William Baral, Armando Martinez Brito, and Roman Nappi won the Creativity and Innovation Award from Sandia National Laboratory. Um, Luke. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lucas Blakesley and his team at Santa Fe High School won the Environmental Modeling Award. And Evan Kluke, a senior, will begin his internship at the New Mexico Consortium, where he will be developing a nuclear magnetic resonance structure, which will be put in use at Texas A&M University. Senator Ben Ray Lujan and Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona visited Santa Fe High School. Um, our baseball team finished 20th in state, and our men's varsity tennis team went undefeated at districts and is in participating in state. That's all. Great stuff, thank you. For Capital High School, we also have supercomputing. Barbara, don't kill me for <laughs> mispronouncing this name. Tara Grit. Ted. Ted. Okay, Tedritz. Okay, I'm sorry. Barbara Teretz for being selected by her students as Teacher of the Year. These students completed our academic marathon. Valentino Ornilas team won the Environmental Modeling Award. The team of Joshua Tam Tamara, Zachariah Birch, Brittany Marquez, and Isael Argon were chosen as one of the eight finalists and given the Environmental Modeling Award. Hario Zalas, Mar 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 Mariah Mejias, Juan de la Riva, and Gil Gilberto Morales submitted the report Music on Mars using four spectra to differentiate Martian technology. Another update is that we are expanding dual credit opportunities. We've worked with SFCC and will offer two additional dual credit courses next year. Both Mr. Toad and Todd and Mr. Gerdner will be teaching dual credit courses. We have a group of 15 students participating in OSHA training to earn their certification. This was in collabor collaboration with Builders Trust and the Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association. And last but not least, I'd like to give a shout out to all our seniors that are graduating this year. I'm so proud of all of them. President Noble. I, I think you also forgot a very important update about your testimony in front of the LESC. You represent at Capitol High School. Yeah, that, that was also. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to think that my work speaks for itself, <laughs> but that that was also very beautiful experience. I, I'm glad our students, Desert Sage, I'm a student from Española Valley High School, also gave their testimony to our legislators about our experience during the pandemic. A number of legislators posted how pleased they were to hear from you on social media and various other places. I think there was accolades. So thank you for doing that. Okay, thank you both for the updates. Really appreciate it. We'll move on to board announcements and follow up. Dr. Gonzalez. 
Um, Madam President, uh, members of the board, and Superintendent Chavez, tomorrow evening, Partners in Education is going to be having their 11th annual art show with about 70 Santa Fe Public Schools students uh, displaying their works. And that will be held tomorrow evening, as I said, from 5 to 6.30 at the New Mexico M Museum of Art in their patio. So hope you'll be able to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Great to know. Board Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of accolades and then one uh, announcement that may seem tangentially related to the board, but I hope I'll be able to justify why it is related to the board and to SFPS. Um, first, I wanted to commend Cesar Chavez on a really exceptional um, international night. I saw uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Kathy Casaus at, um, at the event and it was overwhelming just the number of people who came and the amount of work that the community put into it. It was really exceptional and um, I know and I hope that they feel very proud of themselves. Um, I also wanted to shout out Mr. Hunter and that excellent presentation um, and knowing about those portfolios. I think that's really um, fantastic and I'm also excited that I have a kiddo at, um, at NAVA seeing that work. Um, and then I also just wanted to recognize that today, May 5th, is the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, Two-Spirit, and Relatives Day of Awareness and Action. Um, there is an action happening at the plaza right now um, that will end with a candlelight vigil at 7.30. So depending on who's listening or watching or here, um, I would recommend staying for the entire board meeting, of course, but, um, but I think it's a really important event to note. Um, I do just want to note that um, New Mexico does have the highest case of missing and murdered indigenous relatives in the country um, by number, not by capita, um, and that uh, we make up 10% of the population. I should note that I'm indigenous. I'm a member of the Choctaw Nation. Um, we make up 10% of the population, but 50% of the missing and murdered indigenous or missing and murdered people, and that 84% of indigenous women will experience in their lifetime some form of violence. And I think it's important to note this because we have so many indigenous students, so many indigenous nations represented in SFPS as well as indigenous educators, that we really take a moment to recognize the impact that this has on our district and on our community. Thank you very much, Board Member Anderson. Appreciate that. Um, I also just wanted to mention that it is Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, so for, <laughs> yes. So, and as Board, Cash, Board Member Cashman used to say, for all the thousands of people watching, um, please remember to appreciate the staff uh, that are so valuable to the students in your life. Um, we do need to, I very much appreciate what President Mayer said, that we need to behave like a family, um, which includes appreciation, uh, and ideally lots of it after a couple rough years. I'm guessing this is also in the superintendent's announcements, but um, just in, in the, in, as long as we do accolades, wanted to uh, congratulate two teachers from Gonzales Community School who uh, received Teachers Who Inspire Awards, Ms. Kahawai and Ms. Young, the music teacher. Um, Ms. Kahawai, of course, is also the recipient of the Milken Award and was with us um, not too long ago. So congratulations to them um, and really to all of our teachers and staff who uh, are very close to completing another year and um, that is cause to celebrate. <laughs> Anything else on board announcements? All right, we'll move on to superintendent announcements and follow up. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. Uh, we will make an official announcement of those who won the Teachers Who Inspire Award at our next board meeting. There are seven. We've awarded three, so we have four more to go. We also had a Golden Apple winner, which we'll make an announcement at a later date as well. So, um, Curative is the new district COVID testing contractor. 
this transition from PMG to curative. Testing began April 26th when PMG was notified that we were moving to a new vendor. On May 2nd was the first day of implementing site-based surveillance testing to increase convenience for completing the testing and improve our compliance rate. Again, uh, we are trying to do this um, and meeting the, the staff where they need, so we thought that this was a great transition to have that site-based testing for not only uh, students but staff. Uh, Santa Fe Public Schools support communities impacted by fire. We have many schools that are conducting donation drives and fundraisers for the Las Vegas community, which I happen to be a uh, member of, uh, or used to be a member of, uh, which had been impacted by the Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak fire. The following schools, Chaparral, El Camino, El Dorado, Mandela, Ramirez Thomas, Capitol High School, and Santa Fe all have drives that are taking place. And again, t it is Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, this week um, was Teacher Appreciation Week, which we celebrated by delivering over a thousand small tokens of appreciation to our amazing teachers. So I hope you received yours, Miss Mayor. Uh, over the next two weeks, we are excited to also honor our school lunch heroes, who are also here. I noticed them in the back. <laughs> school nurses and also our educational paraprofessionals. Through their dedication, commitment, and enthusiasm, this community these community treasures are impacting lives and ways and life-altering in positive direction. So again, please reckon, uh, join us in recognizing these cherished employees. And tomorrow, surprise, uh, I will be taking part in delivering donuts to our lunch heroes. So you weren't supposed to hear that, but thank you for being in attendance. <laughs> yes. Uh, Cesar Chavez introduces Saturday STEAM camps. Cesar Chavez Elementary is offering a Saturday STEAM camp bi-weekly from 9 to noon to engage its students in plugged and unplugged activities that expose them to science, technology, engineering, art, and math. 31 third to fifth grade students have registered and have all attended. The school's goals through this camp is to become Santa Fe Public Schools' premier computer science elementary hub, promoting risk-taking, a growth mindset, and the ability to fail and continuing to per persevere and provide students with equitable access to computer science. Santa Fe Public School Town Hall follow-up. As you know, we met with many members of our community to partner with. On Monday, May 2nd, we began notifying summer programming partners of approved programs, and that will go out through social media. We'll definitely advertise and get that out to the community so parents know and, and uh, caregivers know where these camps are gonna take place. Uh, in total, we notified 12. There could be a 13th partner, and uh, they range from um, fun and exciting uh, programs like Little Globe Education, uh, which helps students learn filmmaking, animation, and other digital stor storytelling tools, to Earth Care, which will braid its ukulele music program, Danza Azteca, and written oral expression into summer en enrichment program for ch children and their families over eight weeks. So that's an exciting announcement that we'll definitely get out to everyone. Yes. Uh, update on our inaugural Santa Fe Public Schools golf tournament. We wanna thank everyone who participated, who also sponsored the event. The fundraiser was a great success we were able to raise over $40,000. So I do want to uh, acknowledge our, our diversity engagement and community uh, uh, engagement department for pulling this off within four weeks. All this money is going back to towards supporting our staff and students, such as retiree dinner, buying the seniors their banners, bringing back the uh, years of service pins for all employees. So it's all going back to staff and students. So we want to thank all those that participated. Uh, Amy Bill earns awards in the Cavu Climate Innovations Challenge. Nine New Mexico student projects earned awards at the Climate Innovation <coughs> Challenge virtual student showcase, including two from Amy Bill. New Mexico students competed against five other states, Colorado, Florida, Idaho, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And Kenyan students whose presentations uh, evaluated a climate vulnerability or impact and presented a creative solution. Amy Bill won outstanding entry by a large group or class for playground, 
by fourth grade students and also outstanding entry in elementary school for Fish Paradise. We want to say congratulations. <laughs> Couple more. Congratulations to Mandela and Aspen students and teachers on award-winning art. Santa Fe Public Schools won honors in the 2022 Future Voices of New Mexico Festival. Future Voices is a collaborative filmmaking project that takes its inspiration from working with indigenous and underrepresented voices from around the world. Santa Fe Public School winners for photography, all from Mandela, they won first place in color, first place in street, third place in humor, as well as honorable mention. In landscape, they won first place, second place, third place, and honorable mention. In portrait, first place, and honorable mention. In manipulative, first place, honorable mention, and second place. And then in film, all from Aspen Community School, third place in comedy, first place in animation, and also third place. Uh, I also want to uh, recognize that Capitol High School Art will be on display at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum tomorrow night. I will take part as a judge and a presenter of awards. Uh, we also attended the Nina Otero Family Night uh, last night, and that was a, a great event. It was a film that was developed there on site by staff and students to honor Nina Otero and what she brought to Santa Fe Public Schools. She was also the first superintendent, female superintendent of Santa Fe Public Schools, and she was an advocate for bilingual education and also an advocate for our Native American students. So wanted to make sure we, we mentioned her and honored her as uh, all the contributions she brought to Santa Fe Public Schools. And that does con conclude my announcements. Thank you, superintendent. Um, uh, on the, if I might ask a couple quick mm -hmm. questions, on the eight weeks in the summer, can you say a little bit just about how the funding will mm -hmm. work for that, please? Yes, absolutely, and great question. Thank you, uh, Board President Noble. What we're doing this summer uh, is twofold. It's the first part is to really develop a menu of options for our community partners to partner with our school and uh, develop that menu for, for our principals to look at, and it's almost a, a menu for them to choose from to partner for after school activities so we don't put that added stress on our teachers. Uh, this year, to be in compliant with the use of ESSER and also extended learning, we had to ask our staff and our teachers to really uh, help us out. They were the ones in charge of after school programming. So this was a way to alleviate that added uh, responsibility on our staff and really have them focus on teaching and learning. So again, this is a great opportunity for next school year. In the meantime, what we want to do is provide enriched activities over the summer for our students, Santa Fe Public School students, to participate in. We've mentioned some of the, the programming that would take place, um, and it's really free. It's going to be free of charge, no cost to, to our students to participate, and it's really enriched activities to help accelerate their learning for next school year. So it puts them in a better position uh, to be successful, right? And we always talk about that summer learning loss. Well, this is a creative way to address it and it's through ESSER funding. And so we sort of get to try this out in the summer and then hopefully expand in the school year. This is fabulous. Yeah, absolutely, and we're still meeting with community partners. I've met with some music groups uh, that wanna engage and uh, try to promote music within Santa Fe Public Schools, so I gave them the opportunity as well to put something on, so if we have still those out there listening and want to participate, if uh, Ms. Grace Mayer wants to put on an art camp, we're definitely interested. We will fund it. We will provide the facility as well. So I want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that as well. Working with Deputy Superintendent Wagner, we're offering uh, individuals to come in and utilize our facilities and provide funding for stipends, materials, and uh, anything that they need to provide these camps for our students. Thank you very much. And this is something coming to fruition that a lot of us have been thinking and talking about for a long time. Really appreciate you getting there, but it really feels like a community schools effort if we can wrap around, engage community partners, and be way more family friendly in terms of um, what we can offer in the summer to stop the learning slide that occasionally occurs, but also for after school enrichment. That is uh, really just music to my ears, so thank you. 
Um, and for the photos and film from, you know, it sounds like Mandela and Aspen were very big winners. Are those available to see anywhere? Uh, Mr. Donarski, can we work on getting those up on our website? Great. And, and the video from Nino Otero. Thank you. Any other questions on the superintendent's updates? Okay, we'll move on to our action items. We start with our consent agenda. Um, and I have two small questions on items on the consent agenda. Just go ahead with those. Um, the first one on the budget adjustment requests. Um, I'm hoping, Superintendent, you can explain the Title 19 Medicaid $2 million increase, please. Yes, thank you, Board President Noble, members of the Board. Um, again, this is not additional funding. It is moving funding from revenue to our cash balance, and it is because of improved efforts on reimbursement. As you know, that is how that works. So it's improved uh, efforts on reimbursement. They are timely, they are uh, efficient, and so that shows us that we have a cash balance of $2 million. Now this does not only um, use, it's used for operational uh, services now, but also for next school year. So it's not just for this school year, it's braided over two years. Thank you. Um, and the proposal basically to approve, approve the RFP selection of the school-based health center services, um, just hoping you might say a few words about what we're planning on doing with school-based health center services and if we know where school-based health centers might go. Yeah. Great question. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. Um, you know, as we visited with Secretary Cardona, U.S. Secretary Cardona, and also our Secretary of Education, Steinhaus, this was something that they really did promote, and they really uh, thought we did a great job of providing these school-based health centers um, at our high schools, and we're continuing to take a look at them across the district as kind of a board priority that we mentioned at our, st at our study session, a service that we want to provide our, our students. Um, to make sure that they're healthy, that they are safe, and they, they have a, a safe learning environment. So this is a proposal to review and evaluate a selection committee to um, uh, award the proposal to PMS, Presbyterian Medical Services, who we are currently partnering with, uh, and to move forward with that. So they're for the high schools? They are. Um, El Camino Real has a purpose-built facility, I believe, for that. <laughs> and they have family income index, a lot yes. of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions on the consent agenda? I move approval of thank the you. consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. I will second that. Thank you, Secretary Bose. Discussions, questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have approved the consent agenda. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to item B, our second reading of new policy 355, medical cannabis in schools. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. With us tonight is Mr. Josh Granada, our legal counsel. Good evening, Board President Noble, Board members. Um, tonight we have the second reading of uh, new policy, Medical Cannabis in Schools 355. <clears throat> um, at the last board meeting, um, Sue O'Brien and Anita Hett gave you a description of what this policy entails. Um, a couple of years ago, prior to the pandemic, um, some legislation was changed to allow for medical cannabis in schools. Um, this legislation changed many different areas of law, including the public school code, the Lynn and Aaron Compassionate Use Act, which allows for medical cannabis use, as well as some criminal provisions. 
Um, ultimately, the regulations coming down from the public education department requires the school to pass a medical cannabis in schools policy. And so we, we ask that you do um, approve the policy that's before you tonight. Um, at this point in time, um, as, you, as you're well aware, um, cannabis is not is illegal to use from the federal perspective. And so that puts a lot of limits on what states can do. Um, as you're probably well aware, many states allow for medical cannabis use. Um, some states don't. Um, our state does. And so this, <clears throat> through, through some legislative changes, um, the legislature has allowed for cannabis to be on campus. Um, ultimately, the the way in which the legislation is written, it would be fairly broad, um, but there are still some limitations in which we can enact the legislation. Ultimately, um, nurses can't administer um, cannabis to students because their license prohibits them to do so. It, it would be a violation of federal law. Um, so ultimately, what, what we're left with is a policy that's going to allow for medical cannabis to be used on campus um, under limited circumstances. Um, students would not be allowed to possess medical cannabis, and so uh, uh, their health care, um, the, there's a lot of definitions here that you can see. Um, the primary caregiver, which is typically the parent, would be allowed to administer the cannabis and possess it on campus. Um, until there are changes federally, uh, we, we simply can't allow for school personnel to administer and store and possess cannabis. Um, it would make it easier, but it presents liabilities that um, I don't think that the district should, um, should um, take on at this point in time, considering the federal stance on the legality of cannabis. Um, and so if you have any questions, I can, I can try to answer them for you. Um, and we ask that you do pass this policy. Thank you, Mr. Granada. And this is the second reading. We did talk about this at the last board meeting. Are there any questions, comments? I move approval. Thank you, board member Anderson. I'll second. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. We have a motion and a second to approve our second reading of new policy number 355, medical cannabis in schools. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have approved the new policy. Thank you. Thank you. Moving along. Now, action item C, stipend for student nutrition, kitchen managers, non-represented employees in the fiscal year 2021-22. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. As you know, in October of 2021, uh, it was agreed with NEA represented employees that we would provide a $2,000 retention stipend uh, for the employee group. Non-represented student nutrition managers did not receive the NEA negotiated stipend of $2,000. I met with them in the boardroom, if you remember that, yes. <laughs> and we uh, agreed to give them the $1,000 stipend at that time. Now, student nutrition budgets have improved, and now we're uh, able to provide them that additional $1,000 to make it whole, as they would now receive a $2,000 retention stipend. The one-time payment uh, for student nutrition managers uh, would be distributed no later than June of 2022 to the kitchen managers who are currently employed and return to work on January 2nd of 2022. So. We do ask for approval of this recommendation. Madam President, I move to approve this retention stipend for the kitchen workers. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Board Member Anderson. If I could just ask one quick question, if that's okay. I'm going to vote in favor of it, obviously. <laughs> but Superintendent, I just wanted to know where we are um, in terms of the, the managers being able to join NEA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Board Member Anderson, President Noble, members of the board. We are still working this through with uh, NEA President Grace Mayer. We are still talking to them about some of the language in their job description, even the title, 
and how it fits within the CBA because we do have some employee groups that are not covered by the CBA. So it's still a work in progress, but we are communicating on that weekly. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the stipend for student nutrition, kitchen managers, and non-represented employees for the current fiscal year. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we have approved the stipend. <laughs> Thank you all for your work, and we do hope that we can make good progress on representation and um, that we will hopefully be onwards and upwards through the future. Thank you very much, and thanks for being here. Okay, um, action item D. 2022-2023 Title III English Language Acquisition Local Plan application and application. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. With us tonight is our Director of Language and Culture, Ms. Lisa Vigil. Good evening, Board President Noble, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. Um, I'm here tonight to request approval of our Title III English Language Acquisition Local Plan in the amount of $275,000, approximately. Um, these funds are um, supplemental funds. So the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights and U.S. Department of Justice sets policies and requirements that states, school districts, and schools must follow to fulfill the obligations under federal law to ensure that English learners have equal access to a high quality education and the opportunity to achieve their full academic potential. Title III funds is a two year subgrant and these funds can only be used to supplement EL support services that are above and beyond what our legal obligations are to meeting those needs of our English learners. And I'm happy to take any questions. Go ahead, Board Member Anderson. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, the parent, family, and community engagement total? Um, mm -hmm. And if there are other funds within the department that also cover community engagement as well? Yes, uh, board member Anderson, President Noble and Superintendent Chavez, members of the board. This is my first time in a long time addressing the board. <laughs> So I apologize. I forget, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems minimal when you look at it uh, um, as a $2,000 allocation. Um, we also, in the language and culture department, oversee bilingual education funds that also support a lot of um, English language acquisition. Um, Title III is specifically for English acquisition and can't be mixed. Uh, we also have a lot of professional development with our curriculum and instruction department and teaching and learning with, um, oh my gosh, Vanessa Romero, um, um, providing those kinds of professional developments. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, we use the 2000 specifically um, for bringing in families to pay childcare um, food that isn't allowable um, in operational. And so we use that to, um, to bring in those families and have our meetings. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What happens when this funding runs out? Good question, Board President Noble, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. Um, so the money continues to um, be accessible for the two years. It doesn't run out. Um, it's based on our EL population. So as long as we have English learners in our district, which continues to grow, we're currently at around 33% K through 12. We don't identify English learners in pre-K, so that's why we kind of single out K through 12. Um, we'll continue to receive Title III funds as long as the board continues to approve. There is um, assessment, and I know um, that our union president mentioned assessment. As long as we continue to approve Title III and receive those funds for the above and beyond services, our students will have to take the access annually, which is a four-hour approximately long test that um, assesses an English learner's 
reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills. Um, so that is an assessment that is associated with receiving Title III funds. We are also expected to um, provide professional development to our teachers, superintendents, to our board, um, and to other staff in our district about serving our English learners. Wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you. I move approval. I'll second. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, with a second by Board Member Anderson. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second for approval of our Title III English, English Language Acquisition Local Plan and Application. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have approved that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving swiftly along to action item E as an elephant, the FY23 ATC budget submission. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. With us tonight is our CFO, Mr. Robert Martinez, also the business manager from ATC, Christine Garcia, and principal, Mr. Jason Morgan. I just want to add, they also had a Golden Apple recipient, and they were awarded that this week, so I want to make sure we acknowledge that. Thank you, uh, Madam President, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, um, we are bringing the FY23 uh, operating budget for your approval tonight on behalf of the Academy and Technology. Uh, Academy, sorry, the ATC budget. Uh, that's easier to say. So, um, Cody, if you'll share the uh, actual budget roll-up, and uh, I'll just go through some of the basics, and if you have any in-depth questions, I know that Christine and Jason are more than welcome to jump in and uh, speak to those things. So uh, their uh, budget, the proposed budget for FY23 um, from the operational is 4.6, which was an increase of 408,000 uh, from the FY22 current fiscal year budget. Uh, this is broken out between uh, several different elements of uh, salaries, whether it covers instructional salaries, um, administrative support salaries from uh, um, uh, support services, uh, any school administration, any any of those um, items, including all the basic uh, life, dental, visions, health, um, as well. So uh, that's their operational. Uh, rolling down, we have their. Sorry, my laptop is going way too fast for me. Um, rolling down into the food service, their budget remained flat from 42,000 last fiscal or this current fiscal year into FY23. Their athletic uh, uh, budget um, decreased $3,000 uh, FY23. Uh, Idea B, moving into their federal grants and uh, uh, their uh, Idea B decreased in 10,000 uh, going into FY23. Title II also. Um, increased uh, by $901 for a total budget of 12517 Perkins uh, increased as well, about $1,500. Esser 3 uh, increased 11400 for a total budget, FY23 for ATC for $90,000. Uh, Next Gen increased, small amount, uh, $36.40. They have the Davis Scholarship Grant as well, which uh, remained uh, flat at $1,500. And they also have the PSCOC lease assistance, which remained flat as well from the current fiscal year. Uh, moving on to HB 33, which was fund 31600. Uh, their budget increased 102,000. Uh, and their SB 9, 31701, uh, decreased uh, 50,000 for FY23. Their ETN, uh, the EdTech, increased about 45,000. Uh, their operational budget includes a cash carryover, um, also added 1.0 FTE, uh, which um, their instructional budget is 83% of their overall budget. Uh, food service may not be needed as they work with the Santa Fe Public Schools to provide lunches, and the ESSER 3 estimated cash carryover will be for an interventionist position. Their cash balance is about 650000 which is just shy of 14% of their overall budget, so of the operational budget. And uh, that is 
presentation of the roll-up of ATC's FY23 budget. Thank you very much. Anyone have questions on this? Um, sorry, <laughs> that just really making me dizzy when you scroll that. Imagine um, creating it. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Well, it's much better on the printed page. Um, I'm hoping somebody will talk about the cash balance at 14%. Um, and just tell me what your thinking is there, um, what reserves you maintain, and anything else you want to say about that. If you wouldn't mind going up just that way, it's fully accessible to people, watch the thousands of people watching. <laughs> Madam President, I will say that I do know that their cash balance is merely an estimate, and they will pull from it as needed, um, but I will let them speak to uh, Superintendent, Madam President, and members of the board, it is an estimate. We're, we're not sure what it is right now, but we will. It is embedded in the budget, and we will adjust it as necessary. And do you have a target, sort of what you want to keep your cash balance at? Mm -hmm. how, do, how does that work? What is your approach to that cash balance? Uh, thank you for the question, um, Madam President. Um, for me, and, and I think, you know, in terms of uh, school operations, um, that cash balance represents about three months of operational cost. And, you know, when I look at the um, cyber attack that occurred at APS, when I think about what occurred in Bernalillo, um, I imagine scenarios where something similar to like that might happen at DFA or PED, and suddenly revenue ceases to come in. And so being able to operate for at least several months without additional revenue is um, a kind of a logic to having at least that much cash in the bank to make payroll and pay all those bills. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Do we have a recommendation, Superintendent? We do. We recommend approval. Thank you very much. Madam President, I move to approve the ATC budget for next year. I'll okay. second. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Bose, with a second by Board Member Anderson. Any other questions, discussion? Uh, so we have a motion and a second for approval of the ATC budget for 2022-2023. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we have approved your budget. Thank you very much. Thank Congratulations you. on getting it done. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you. Moving on to Roman numeral 10 presentation. We start with FY23 budget strategy and Board of, Board of Education review of operational budget slash ESSER funding. Superintendent. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. Uh, taking us through the presentation tonight will be our CFO once again, Mr. Robert Martinez, myself, and Mr. Howard Exner. Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Superintendent Chavez, Madam President, members of the board, as well as Superintendent Chavez. Um, there are a lot of components to the FY23 budget, a lot of impacts that we're going to go through, but I wanted to give this brief presentation. That way we all know what to expect and what's forthcoming before we bring the budget for approval um, in a future meeting. So moving on to the budget development strategy, our intent of this budget plan was to maintain solvency and establish a method of sustainability uh, and viability that is patterned around the continuation of programs, cost efficiency, and also taking into consideration the current uncertainty of state funding. Uh, we all know that we've experienced uh, those uncertainties, especially from fiscal year to fiscal year with the unit value and what the impacts are going to be with any legislative mandates. So we will talk about those uh, areas to consider are meeting the state requirements, uh, statute requirements for delivery of service and board priorities, which we will visit that later on in the presentation. Cuts and additions must be viewed for long-term impact to future budget years. Anything that is going to be funded by federal funding uh, that is going to be recurring expenditures will have to be moved back into the operating or operational budget at some point. Um, 
let's see, review ESSER three expenditures and find alternative funding sources as needed, and also the attempt to restore the cash balance in accordance with board policy. Uh, I believe the board remembers uh, that during COVID, we the board did uh, go be- approved to go below the uh, 5%. So we're working on uh, getting that back up as that affects many things, uh, also including our bond rating uh, that it has an effect on. Recently, we attended the New Mexico Association of School Business Officials, the NMASBO Spring Budget Conference. There are several updates uh, that we'll share with you all this uh, afternoon. Um, All staff will receive a minimum 7% salary increase to their daily rate for fiscal year 23. And uh, I'll explain to you how we got to the 7% salary increase. And I do want to note that this does exclude Superintendent Chavez. not all, st- all staff, but Superintendent Chavez. So uh, the 3%, as you recall, uh, came not too long ago, the quarter of the 3% uh, for FY22, but the 3% does need to be added to the base, and the 4% uh, will be added on also in fiscal year 23, so the 7%. The new minimums also for principals and assistant principals level one to level three teachers, and the minimum of $15 an hour were also impacts. No additional funding to provide increases for teachers who are advancing levels or to address salary compaction. I know uh, Mr. Howard Exner will speak to that here in just a second. Uh, The family income index will be included in the SEG calculation. Uh, Last year it was provided, or this fiscal year, it was provided to us in a separate allocation, but this year it is included in the 910B5. Talking about the 910B5, there were no major changes to the 910B5 other than our extended learning. Um, And the whole harmless provision, which the district did not qualify in FY22, and we also do not qualify in FY23. I just want to add, with the family income index, as we know, this year we had um, three schools participate. We had Al Camino uh, Academy, we had Edward Ortiz Middle School, and we had Cesar Chavez Elementary. For next school year, it's two of the three, we will have Al Camino, once again, being funded through the Family Income Index for $402,000 and uh, 277 Ortiz Middle School, $285,000. And then the new school this year will be Salazar Elementary for $127,000. And Mr. Exner will talk to us a little bit about the salaries and the bump in levels. Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, good evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about some things related to employee salary, specifically licensure advancement. We this year have 84 employees who have notified us that they intend to advance either from level one to two or two to three. We ask employees to inform us of that by the end of October each year. Helps us to do some budget planning, figure out what our expectations are, but also to provide support to the employees. Our teacher mentor department headed by Vanessa Angel provides a lot of support to those teachers throughout the year as they prepare their dossier to submit to the public education department as part of the advancement process. So 84 teachers, generally the advancement from level one to two and two to three you can consider to be $10,000. Minimum salary for level one teachers next year will be 50,000, level two 60,000, level three 70,000. But on top of that, if the teacher is somewhere in the salary schedule beyond that initial level, um, entry level point, their increase could be quite a bit more. So I um, prepared an example for you. If we have a level two teacher who is anticipating moving to level three next year and is currently on row 10, indicating generally that they've been in the profession for 10 years and are on row 10 of the salary schedule, their current salary would be $54,506. With the increases that the PED is providing next year, along with that licensure advancement from level two to level three, their row 11 salary this year, and this is still in negotiation, but right now it's looking to be 70,420. So the salary increase for that specific employee would be almost $16,000, 15,914, which on a percentage basis is 29, 000, 29.2%. Um, One other um, point that Superintendent Chavez asked me to touch on tonight 
was the minimum salaries, um, as I mentioned a second ago, level one, two, and three, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, and what that means if we were to determine it based on an hourly rate of pay. And this is based on the teacher's salaries, uh, work schedule of a nine-month contract or 180 days and a seven-hour expected work day. So for level one teacher, the hourly rate is approximately $40, $39.68 an hour, approximately $47 for level two, and approximately $55 for level three. So that give you an idea of what that means for a 50, 60, or $70,000 salary for our employees for next year. Thank you, Mr. Exler. Thank you. And just to add to bullet three, um, you know, we're funded to really get our teachers to the new minimums. What we're doing right now through negotiations is developing pay tables so we can also grant years of service, uh, degrees that they may hold, and that way we can provide a little more cushion to really try to help the compaction. Correct, thank you. Moving on to the NMASBO conference updates continued. Uh, the 2% increase in the ERB employer contribution in FY23. In FY22, we saw a 1%. Um, FY23, we'll see a 2%. The NIMSIA, New Mexico Public Schools Insurance Authority, premium rate increases employee benefits fund. The high option is a 6% increase, and the low option is a 3.2% increase. About 90% of our employees are on the high option. Um, also, the New Mexico Public Schools Insurance Authority premium rate increases risk fund at 6.73% of an increase. Update on the FY23 unit value. The initial unit value of 5,450.92 was provided to the district on April 9th of 2022, which is an increase of $587.92 from the final unit value of FY22, which is an approximate increase of about 12%. Uh, the FY21 House Bill 2 amended Public School Finance Act to remove local and federal revenue credits, however, not state credits such as the energy efficiency credits, which is reflected on the 910B5, and I will show you that on the following slide. Or not this slide, but the one after this. Membership comparisons, this is our 80th and 120th day average from FY21, which is how we are currently funded now in this fiscal year. And the 80th and 120th day average of FY22 is based off of what we are funded in FY23. There was a net change in membership by 400, which is uh, approximately a lost revenue of over $2 million. Just want to add, if you remember, uh, even though we have a loss of 400, Desert Sage Academy, which typically in the past was about 70 to 75 students, is almost at 500 students as it currently stands. So by providing that option for families to attend remotely, we did be able to uh, keep a lot of those students within Santa Fe Public Schools. There's a lot of information here on the FY23 SEG tool, which is our 910B5. This is a comparison between the current fiscal year and where we're going in FY23 and how we're funded. It breaks up every, almost every element in the 910B5 to show you where the significant impacts really are. And uh, as you can see, uh, even though we've had decreases in membership, we've had increases in funding, a lot of that stems from the increase in the unit value. Uh, it rolls over from uh, special ed, from CNC, D&D, &D, uh, gifted, all the way down to um, fine arts, bilingual, elementary PE, uh, national board certified teachers, the school size adjustment, at risk, growth units, homeschool student program, extended learning time program, which you can see there that the district is not participating in this year. Last year we were funded 5.9 million, just a little about over, and um, but we are not participating in that this year. So uh, that will be reflected on the 910B5 at the bottom. Um, also the charter school activities, but the grand total SEG program units uh, last year, which included the uh, extended learning, was 115.8 million. Uh, and this year we are at 115.8 million, not um, participating in extended learning. So even though you see it flat or maybe an increase when you see us subtract out extended learning, cost has gone up across the board. Mm -hmm. Utilities, uh, personnel, salaries, so cost has really um, increased for next school year. Right. And then there in red, you'll see the energy efficiency uh, credit that I spoke about. Um, 
uh, that remains the same from uh, more than last year, but uh, that's something standard that we see on our 910B5. Uh, so the base SEG that we are currently uh, expected to receive this fiscal year is 109.6 million, and the base SEG that we're expected to receive uh, for FY23 is 115.5, which is an increase of 5.9 um, and additional revenue from the unit value increase. These are the impacts of the FY23 operational budget. These are just some of the components that I mentioned when we went through some of the NMASBO updates, the estimate of the 7% salary increase uh, for all employees, uh, besides the superintendent, would be 4.9 million. The estimate of the $15 an hour minimum, bringing any employee below 15 that the increase did not bring above that amount would be 55,000. Estimate of principal and assistant principal minimum, also uh, taking into consideration the 7%, 265,000. Uh, teacher level one to level three minimum, also taking into consideration the 7%, 454,000. The estimate of the 6% NIMSIA benefits increase on the employer side is 580,000. The estimate of the 2% ERB increase on the employer side is 355,000. Estimate of employee insurance increase 6% is 440,000. That is a board priority. Uh, the three-tier teacher licensure movement, as Howard mentioned, it's about $10,000 per uh, teacher advancement, 830,000. Utilities, we're expecting to see an increase of 370,000 in our utilities. Uh, absorbing vacant FTE and adjustment to right sizing will bring back 1.2 additional revenue to the district. Also cutting contracts 1.085 um, will bring back additional revenue to the uh, operational budget as well. The NIMSIA risk premium also decreased this year from last year. Uh, providing 54,000, and as you saw in the last slide, the additional revenue from the 910B5, which is our SEG tool, was 5.9. Factoring in all these considerations leaves the total impact at zero. So currently, we have a uh, balanced budget if uh, nothing changes and everything remains the same. Um, and Robert, I just want to add when we're looking at salaries for both principals and uh, teachers. We have to give them that 3% that's required by law. Once you factor in that 3%, you have to see if that takes you to the new base minimums. If it does not, you are automatically going to adjust them back to those base minimums and then get an average of 7% for that employee group. So we will have uh, individuals receiving different percentage rates. We have some principals, uh, even teachers, as Mr. Exner mentioned, 20 29% and some, you know, closer to that seven. So it all depends where they fall on that salary schedule. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I will say, you know, a lot of building the budget has been moving non-recurring expenditures to federal funding sources as allowable, uh, you know, to create that flexibility and get the uh, budget to be balanced for FY23. Moving on uh, to the uh, ARP Act or ARPA, and the ESSER three elementary and secondary school emergency relief funding. Uh, this is the plan, and this is where we're at with uh, this fund. So as you recall, we had CARES, and we also had ESSER II. Uh, those funding sources will be totally spent by the end of this fiscal year, so uh, the uh, large amount of the federal funding that we have moving forward for relief funding is ESSER III. Uh, it is on a three-year plan. Um, as you can see, for FY22, our total budget was $5.1 million. Um, that 5.1 will not be entirely spent as some of those expenditures were geared towards um, other funds and other pandemic relief funds. So uh, those uh, funding uh, dollars will be moved uh, to another place within the plan. We also received an increase of $1 million due to the PED releasing held back funds, which were held back per uh, federal recommendations. As you'll see moving forward for FY23, our budget currently built to ESSER 3 is 7.3 million and in FY24 would be 6.5 million. I just wanna add on ESSER 3, we always have the opportunity to edit and amend the application and reallocate funds. And if it happens to be a board priority, that's a, another way to be able to fund those priorities. Thank you, Superintendent Chavez. Um, also, some programs uh, cross multiple categories within this plan. Uh, so, but it is uh, 
very well administrated by um, Ryan Cooper and Melissa Blaylock, and they've worked really, really hard on it. But uh, So I know they have it down to a T, and uh, they really stay within the plan. And as Superintendent Chavez mentioned, whenever there needs to be any updates or changes to the plan, they do make those adjustments. Moving on to the board priorities, social, emotional, mental health of staff and students. Uh, address attendance and re-engagement of learning. Enhancement of teaching and learning to further equity and employee increase in benefits as the board has uh, covered in previous years. And we will welcome any feedback as you uh, take this information away with you. And if you want to edit, make changes, that's your opportunity. And we can work with you. We can meet with you individually or in small groups of two. <laughs> This is the budget process and milestones uh, for April. As I mentioned, the unit value and program funding when we attended the spring budget workshop April 6th through the 8th of 2022. Uh, Board of Education update on budget priorities, which took place on April 28th last week. Uh, moving forward into the month of May, uh, the site-based budget reviews are pending. Those uh, work templates will hopefully be sent out by the end of the week or by the middle of next week. But uh, that is for the sites to uh, build their budgets based on their enrollment. Uh, they build it from their supplies and materials to their FTE to um, really anything that they have across their budget within their site. Board of Education Review of Operational Budget and SR3 Funding, which is occurring at this moment. Uh, and the Board of Education Review of the Initial Operating Budget uh, will be bringing to you all on May 19th for approval. Uh, if the Board chooses to not approve the operating budget on May 19th, we will need to request a tentative special board meeting on May 26th because the uh, adoption and submission to the PED for the budget is June 1st at 8 a.m. And other than that, um, we'll stand for any questions, comments. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. And just to clarify that presumably we adopt the budget before it's due at 8 a.m. on June 1. Yes. Okay. That's why May 19th we're bringing it uh, for approval. Yeah. Uh, unless it's not approved in May 26th, but yes. Thank you. Questions on the budget? Secretary Bose? Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. Um, I am looking at page nine where uh, there was a breakdown of the ARP and SR funding. Um, and I'm just wanting to make sure there's a section there under the response efforts for COVID-19 about indoor air quality and that's all zeroed out. And I'm assuming that that's because we addressed all of that um, at the start of the pandemic. So we yeah. don't need to spend our, our you funds are correct. there. Okay. Correct. And we also did receive additional uh, relief funding for that. Uh, in a whole nother separate fund. Okay. Just to make sure that everyone listening knows it was taken care of. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a, a big priority as we we're using ESSER 1 and 2. Thank you. And I have one other question um, slash comment. Um, on page 7, I'm looking at the arts, the fine arts education um, line. And since our study session last week where we briefly discussed our board priorities um, and we were thinking specifically about social emotional learning, something that's really been sitting in my mind is that we have, we know we have the Office of Student Wellness has incredible programs. We heard all about that at the study session in March. Um, but also thinking about other areas where programs already exist. Um, and one of those that came up for me was, was music and art. And, you know, we've all heard about studies that link music education to higher test scores, but there's also really significant social emotional learning that happens when students participate in art. And so I'm pleased to see that there is no cut there. In fact, a funding increase. And um, I hope that, that those are rolled out um, in ways that really benefit our students. Thank you. Secretary Bose, if I may add uh, into that, um, the fine arts and the music also uh, utilize mill levy funding a lot for uh, the purchase of instruments. And um, the district has really, they have one of the largest uh, abilities of budget within the mill levy to, um, budget. So, Board 
Board Member Anderson. Thank you, Board President Noble, uh, Board Member Superintendent Chavez. Um, I have a few questions, so if we can go maybe page by page if that works. Okay. Um, on if it's all right, oh, Board yeah, Member Anderson, yeah. if other board members want to piggyback oh, when yeah, you're on a subject. Totally. Yes, okay, yeah, thank I'll you. I'll just try to go in order so that Please we Please proceed. Yes. Um, so on page three, the new minimums of $15 an hour, maybe Dr. Gonzalez can speak more clearly to this because Senator Stewart sponsored this bill, but the increase in EA minimums, is that the same, that bill that passed, is that the same as the increase to $15 an hour? Well, so I'll, I'll let uh, Superintendent Chavez speak it is. to that. It, it is. is. Okay, so we do have same. currently some EAs under the $15 okay, mark. So we will have to bump them up to 15 okay. as the new state law was passed. Okay, great. And then that 15 will be people who move up, and then those who were making 15 before will get the 7% increase, so there's not... Correct. Okay. And we're still going through negotiations. Okay. So it's not set in stone. Right. Uh, I think she, Grace Mayor, uh, President Mayor left. Okay. But we are talking about salaries uh, for EAs as well across the board okay. and what it looks like because some special ed uh, EAs, they're called EBAs, mm -hmm. uh, get paid a little more okay. than a general ed EA. So okay, we're great. still going through negotiations with the union. Great. I'm interested. I used to be an EA. My mom is an EA and my sister is an EA. So I know how hard that work is. Um, and I know I, we wish we could give them a lot more than $15 an hour. <laughs> just to piggyback on that, it, in, it's everybody. It includes custodians and cafeteria there workers. There will be nobody everybody. under $15 no, an hour in the district. Okay. No FTE position. Okay. Great. Excellent. Um, let's see. That was my question on that. Does that, anybody else have any questions? there and then my next question is um, on page seven if anybody has in between there just let me know um, what does adjusted ancillary FTE mean so the adjusted ancillary FTE so that is our okay so let's see decrease in ancillary it's Okay, there it is. Okay, so yeah, and FY, sorry, it's so small and it's even smaller on my laptop. Uh, so we did have a decrease in our ancillary FTE uh, and also the decrease in the funding by, let's see, 226 FTE. What is and, an ancillary FTE? And board oh, member. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Great question, board member Anderson. Um, when you look at that heading, it's uh -huh. really special ed. Okay. So as the special ed numbers decrease, so does the ancillary staff. Okay. The ancillary staff are those that provide the services uh, outside the classroom. Okay, got it. Yeah, so Counselors. It's, it's always interconnected. Okay, got it. So those are like speech therapists, mm -hmm. occupational Correct. therapists. Okay, great. That's excellent. And then for the homeschool program, I obviously have a special interest in this since my daughter's in it. Are we paid per instructional hour for them? Do you know? Since they're only in class 12. So it's the membership that it's counts the membership. towards the okay. SEG. So okay, whenever somebody is enrolled in a homeschool program, we do get to count them as part of our membership. Okay, great. So that 0 .875, is that, how is it less than one? So there are factors in the, this is not the 910B5, okay. but there are factors and weighted measures within the 910B5, so okay. we don't actually get the full individual for okay. certain programs. Some of them, they divide them by five, or by 0.5. Uh, some of them, like I said, have different weights, uh, but we're not, we're not funded off of each individual for certain programs like homeschool. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there? Okay, um, I, on page eight, um, why are our utilities going to go up? Is that, I, I don't, is that a change in like the rates or is that a change in our facilities or? I think, I think it's, you know, in talking with uh, Lisa Randall, it's kind of been across the board. I know we've had a lot of our uh, solar uh, and, and hoping to see our utilities fall, but you know, there are certain things that um, uh, are still going to take an impact, especially, you know, with all the air quality that okay. we have done and all the ventilation and, you know, certain items like that. Um, but it does increase the utility costs. But just the district ensuring that all of our buildings are safe and have the, are, are equipped with the correct equipment, okay. uh, it does cause the uh, utility bill to continue to rise. That makes sense. Um, and then on contracts, I know you mentioned that there are contracts that were being cut in, in general, can you talk about which contracts were cut and 
Why? Well, we're still going through that process okay. of reviewing contracts. Okay. Uh, what we're going, going to do is look at uh, how we're going to budget contracts. Okay. And what we're doing is budgeting off actuals okay. rather than projections. Okay. And so when you're doing that, it does create a savings. Okay. Um, when you're doing it off of uh, projections, you're really tying up a lot of the funding to a certain vendor or many vendors. And so we don't have that. Uh, flexibility when they open up a PL for X amount and they only utilize 20% of it. Okay. And I'll let you know there's over probably about 275 contracts that we have right now just out of operational. So there's a lot to go through. I, I know the last uh, previous fiscal year when we did this, um, some contracts did not see any difference. Uh, some saw just small differences, but some were just no longer needed. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, those considerations are taking place. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. Can I jump in? Yeah, I, have, I have a question also about the contracts, and I understand it's still in progress, but I'm curious if you have a sense now of what percentage of those, like, or if any of them um, have a direct impact on the classroom. And if they have a direct impact, then we really take them into consideration and push them aside. What we're looking at in contracts, uh, Mr. Martinez and I, is when we're opening up again a, a PO for a vendor and it's opened up for $500,000 and they're utilizing 50000 So it's tying up 450000 of our budget. So that's when we go back to uh, looking at actuals rather than projections. So when we're looking at contracts, it's not eliminating a contract. Okay. It may just be budgeting it differently. Okay. Budgeting it correctly, really, uh, is what it is. Because when a contract gets encumbered, it holds up and ties up that money, even if expenditures have not hit. Okay. And then we won't see it until the end of the fiscal year, which sometimes doesn't help as much as sometimes we need the money in the moment. Right. Got it. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. You're welcome. On contracts, just these are contracts only in the operational budget. This is only the operational budget. Yes, correct? Madam President. We're not seeing our whole budget here. No. This is the operating correct. budget you will see on uh, May 19th, and there won't be any cuts to those contracts as, uh, you know, a lot of what you'll see on May 19th is part of federal capital outlay. Those are the other elements, transportation, student nutrition. Um, operational is one of our biggest uh, and most uh, critical pieces of the pie, I would say, which takes the most impacts, as you can see. So that's why we bring this to you beforehand, before bringing the operating budget to you for approval. So from what you just said, correct me if I'm wrong, but this $15 an hour minimum then does not include student nutrition or bus drivers in this amount, even though we no. will be paying people $15 an hour. Correct. It, it does not include, it only includes operational employees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because those funds will be able and responsible for covering any, the, any employee in the district will see the same um, whether they're funded from student nutrition, capital outlay, whatnot, but that fund is responsible and will be able to maintain the same things as what's going on in the operational budget. Right. But this is not the total impact? No. Just on operational funded employees. Over $15 an hour minimum. Okay. Yes. That's helpful. Um, Three-tier license. Show that it is not only seven, but it could be eight, nine, ten percent across mm -hmm. the board. I think that's important, and just because it has been such a long-standing board policy, um, we sometimes forget to talk about the fact, but we really should be championing and trumpeting the fact that the board has continued to do this and, and hopefully will continue to. Absolutely. If it wasn't for the board taking on that initiative, uh, many employees, even though they saw an increase in their salary, would probably see a decrease on their paycheck. Mm. See, that's good messaging. <laughs> Thank work. you. You're welcome. Um, okay, maybe we could find some lights for this. For the, yeah. the, do we have lights for the dais up here? I know I'm tired, but I can't see this <laughs> tiny little print. Um, I mean, the flashlight's working for me. Okay, please continue, Board Member Anderson. Hey, look at that. Thank you. I don't have light. another question until slide 10, if anyone has any in between there. Anything else on slide eight then? That's the big one. So what is, uh, yeah, doesn't matter, Never mind. Um, well, 
I guess maybe I have a question. Go ahead. Um, do we have a number um, as far as the adjustment to right sizing? We do. Thank you, uh, Secretary Bose, President Noble, members of the board. What we're looking at to uh, get to 1.2 million is roughly 14 FTEs. Now, when we're, saying, we're using that word, and I made sure to add it, is absorbing vacant FTEs and also right-sizing our school staffing. As we know, we've had declining enrollment, and so we are taking a look at that across the board and seeing how we can right-size our schools. As you know, APS went through a hearing with the LFC, and that was one of the recommendations due to declining enrollment. So we are also uh, using that practice to utilize uh, what the staffing should look like according to the CBA. And again, one of our priorities is to try to keep uh, class sizes as small as possible. However, we may have to um, provide a little larger class. Now, they will not exceed the CBA. They're well within, but we do have to absorb some of those vacant FTEs. Thank you. And can you just, um, for everyone else who doesn't know, uh, go over those class sizes that are outlined in the CBA? <laughs> Another hard question. <laughs> uh, Deputy Superintendent Romero, do you, do you recall the class sizes off the top of your head? Because I know they vary. Um, even uh, they vary so much to say a core curriculum class at the secondary and the uh, electives are so much uh, different. President Noble, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez Howard once again helped, helped out with this. In kindergarten, the caseload has always been 22, but according to state statute, it has moved to 20, so we're gonna adjust that in the CBA. So in kindergarten, it's 20. First grade is 22. Second grade is 24. Third grade is 25. Fourth and fifth grade is 26, and sixth grade is at 27. And then when you get to high school, it depends on the content. So it's serving 150 kids for a particular content area. Thank you. Could I, could I ask a question about that? Um, are, is it a practice or does it happen that those class sizes are exceeded and teachers receive a stipend? Yeah, great question, uh, Board Member Anderson. They do, and when they are exceeded, then we do provide a stipend for them. At times, we also will provide an EA. So it all depends on uh, the class size, the grade level, and what they prefer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then I had another question about the right sizing, if that's okay. Are you, Secretary Bose, are you good? Okay. Um, what happens, how, how are the determinations made about, you know, taking one teacher away from this school and adding a teacher at this school? How, do, how does the determination work, like, as far as who gets moved mm -hmm. or how much say they have in that move? Right, and it's uh, in accordance to the CBA, okay. and it's the date of hire. Okay, got it. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And... I guess my next question is about the board priorities. I know when we talked um, at our study session, we talked about looking um, through an equity lens at all areas of the budget. And I firmly believe that, you know, there is equity in facilities, there's equity in the cash balance, there's equity in all portions of that. Are we gonna be able to sort of talk about that as we go through the budget, how this impacts teaching and learning and how this impacts actual students and actual staff members? Or is that, will that result in an 18 hour meeting? <laughs> no, and, and we can actually meet offline as well. Okay, And great. we can walk you through that. Perfect. But when we're talking about enhancement of teaching and learning to further equity, mm -hmm. that really does play hand in hand with the next um, presentation. Okay. Oh, and great. so, yeah. And so we can talk about that a little further, but I'm more than welcome to meet with you, Mr. Martinez, and we can really deep, okay. take a deep dive into the budget and great. answer any of your questions. That sounds great. Let's do it for sure. And then, um, my last question is, what is the difference between the operating and operational budget? I know we talked about it last time, but I didn't remember the mnemonic. Right, yes. Board Member Anderson, uh, the operational budget is one fund, uh, and the operating budget is compiled of capital outlay, federal grants, uh, student nutrition, transportation, uh, everything that has a hand in the overall budget throughout the district is the operating budget. Okay. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. You're also, welcome. debt service is always surprisingly yeah. large. And that's right. how we pay back our bonds. Okay, got it. 
Thank you so much. That mm -hmm. I'm, um, I will give credit to former board member Mary Ellen Gonzalez for telling me to go through the budget with a fine tooth comb. Um, so I, I hope I'm honoring your, <laughs> your advice. Thank you. So um, just back on page nine and the, the Esser three, um, well, first of all, a request. I'm hoping that we can get, I guess this chart isn't even in color up there, but that we can get col uh, charts in, in color when they're in color. It's helpful. Um, I guess, what is my question? My question is, so we have response efforts, reserve fund, these are categories, indirect, air quality and activities to address needs. How do we see the difference between activities to address needs and response efforts, I guess is a question, but addressing learning loss is a large category in both. So I'm just sort of trying to, to make sense of this chart here and, and wondering um, you know, if, if it might be reconstituted to be a little more clear as to what's going on here. But there's my question. What is the difference between activities to address needs and response efforts? Board President Noble, members of the board, uh, response efforts are really uh, around COVID-19 protocols such as um, uh, response efforts as in uh, the masks, uh, mitigation, um, utilizing the hand sanitizers out there, so we're trying to make sure that we, we respond to the needs of uh, our specific schools. Now that was a big task uh, when we we're utilizing the previous two ESSERs, um, but this is just to make sure that we uh, allocate some funding for it. And your second part? Response. So let's just go with what's the difference between the addressing learning loss at the top of the page and addressing lear learning loss underneath response efforts? That's and just to say, in reserve funds, there's also activities to address academic needs of all students at $4.3 million. So mm -hmm. there's lots of different learning right. activities to address. So the response efforts for uh, the first one, we'll start at the top, activities to address needs. That is specific to um, students. And we're going to provide support and it could be in a, a manner of ways, tutoring, it could be mentorship. So it is providing programming for them uh, to address uh, activities, right? When you're looking at the response efforts, that could be um, a way to provide stipends um, for staff to uh, respond to the efforts of COVID-19 and returning. So we've utilized this in many ways um, as we provided stipends for, for staff to return to work. Um, we recently, I think two years ago, if you remember, uh, Board President Noble, we started off with a $500 stipend and then doubled it. And so we're utilizing these in different ways. So I think we could be more specific because it is twice. It's listed twice, addressing learning loss up on top and below. The response efforts really um, to provide us the opportunity to retain that staff um, in our schools. The one above, activities, um, if you really think about that word, is really specific to, to the students. And Madam President, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, that some of our programs cross multiple categories. So this is what the actual plan is like. So because it's broken up between different program, or one program, different categories, because this is what the plan is, we have to have it broken up like this in, in the plan. And I just want to add, remember, this is just an application that can be amended, so we do have to allocate our entire funding for it, but it can be moved and adjusted. I'm sorry, Mr. Martinez, I did not understand the last point you made. Oh, okay, so uh, Madam President, there could be one program that will touch on several different areas within the description. Uh, so some programs will touch several different uh, categories within this plan. It could be one program, but because we have to have it broken up, as you'll see, maybe learning loss under response efforts and also learning loss under activities, 
because we're required the way we submit the plan to the PED, we have to have it broken up. Thank you. Sorry. Got it that time. Yeah. Um, well, it would be great to whether we can have some examples for what's gone, something like that, because this to me feels. I just I, I can't get my head around. I don't know what this is telling me, particularly well. Um, and it's a lot of money. Uh, so if yeah, if we could get some more details, and you know, even if we need a couple pages, that's fine. Give an idea. Board President Noble. Yes, I, go ahead. Um, thank you. I wonder if it's possible to get definitions for what the categories are. I feel like that would help me understand, like what response means and. Absolutely. And we'll also provide you percentages because there are certain percentages that we do have to meet. And what are reserve funds? What is that category? Reserve funds, 20%. Um, that is uh, to ensure that we're uh, meeting the needs of students that, if you want to take a look, addressing academic needs for all students, uh, as we mentioned, when you're breaking it up and they start to pull out the data, they're pulling out to make sure that you're addressing at-risk students, uh, Native American students, students with disabilities, uh, English language learners. So it's really to address specific groups of students. Any idea why it's called reserve funds? I do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I think I'll leave that mind-bending chart. Um, <laughs> On the board priorities, um, just having glanced at some other things that, that we talked about, um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to give it up, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about HR and how are we going to improve HR. We've got to, um, in my opinion, give some love to that department so that mm -hmm. we can uh, move faster, hire more people, innovate, and make sure that we have um, the teaching and learning working, and right. maybe even a decrease. I know there will always be HR horror stories about somebody who didn't get whatever, but... We've minimized them. Okay. So, and thank you, Board President, Noble members of the board. Uh, some of the things that we've currently have underway and moving forward on in this building, HR currently sits. Uh, previously, they sat um, outside of this building in one of our other locations, so that was a great move. We are currently fully staffed, uh, which is the first time in many, many years that we're fully staffed, and the board did give permission to uh, increase the salaries of our HR department. That was a big issue why we continue to have turnover. The salaries for our HR employees were some of the lowest in the district. So they would enter uh, in with Santa Fe Public Schools, get some experience, and then leave to Los Alamos National Labs, the county, the city. So we've been able to retain our employees, and we've been able to really promote them, and we're in a good position staff-wise. We're continuing to hire. The hiring process has sped up. We are having uh, one or two new hire orientations every week. Uh, we just had one today, hiring a new science teacher and an additional sub, so we're still hiring even this late into the year. So we'll continue to work on our efforts, uh, re-examine what we're doing with Mr. Exner and also Ms. Robin Noble, who is the new executive director of HR, is looking at our systems as well and technology and our software. Is it current? Is it updated? And there are some possibilities as we move forward. And are we able to, I mean, I, I think this was embedded and maybe you even said it explicitly, but really look at our hiring process and figure out how to streamline it and communicate with candidates? Yes, ma'am. And uh, one of the new expectations or just updated expectation is that the HR department reaches out to the individual that applies within 24 hours. Uh, if a school also has a question, is that the response is within 24 hours. So we've expedited that process, as you know. That was a concern that was brought forward that they did not hear from the HR department or the communication was lacking. Thank you. And what about our reimagining process? That does not appear on the list of board priorities here. 
we can end that. This is just uh, the first glance at some of the, the things we talked about last week at our study session. So if that is uh, a wish of the board, we can add that. As you know, we are very close to presenting the redistricting, at least the first presentation to the board. I think it's coming forward, Mr. Granada, next month, possibly. Yep. And then, um, you know, that'd be a great time to piggyback with the reimagining. I think a lot of the work is already being done um, as we're working with CCTE and engaging with our communities. Uh, they are telling us what changes they would like to see within uh, Santa Fe Public Schools and kind of reimagining what's being offered. So I think a lot of that groundwork is starting to be laid currently. We just need to organize it a little better. Um, well, I personally would like to see that um, as a board priority. I think if, if we don't do that now, because as you say, a lot of the, the work is being done where we have a probably once in a couple lifetimes generation, I'm sorry, opportunity, <laughs> a couple generations opportunity to, to do this emerging from COVID as we emerge from COVID and we cannot waste it. And in my opinion, we have to be explicit about it. We have to be explicit about increasing equity as a goal, as we have been for that. And um, we have to weave it together and tell that story and be really intentional about how we involve education. Um, so I don't know if any I, other- I, I agree. <clears throat> Madam President. Can, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I can just add, you know, by adding that, that really does tie everything that we're trying to do together. Um, this is a great opportunity to utilize our ESSER three funding. Um, as you said, President Noble, this is the uh, great opportunity. We have two years remaining on our ESSER fund, so this is, uh, feels like it's the right time. Madam President, I totally agree with that. We really got to look deeply at how we're doing education. And um, it's not working for a lot of kids, so we have to reimagine it. We do, and you know, there are enrollment numbers, there are housing crisis issues, there are a lot of community factors playing into this, but if we don't get intentional about it, um, I honestly don't know what we're doing here. But, okay, so I don't see disagreement um, on the board. Absolute for, agreement. Okay, thank you. Are, and do we feel good about these other four? Okay. The other thing that we talked a bunch about um, at the study session was the, speaking of enrollment, recruitment and communications. I had it on my notes that, and I'm taking pictures of my notes now. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, you know, if you feel that that is sort of, I guess it's in attendance and re-engagement of learning. Um, I don't know if any board members feel that there's anything they want to say additionally about that. Or yeah. Superintendent, go ahead. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. I think we've um, addressed part of it. Um, of, as you know, uh, Mr. Donarski, our public information officer, does a wonderful job with videos, social media. We hired an assistant to really double up that effort. Um, there was a lot asked of Mr. Donarski, uh, videos, presentations, but we have an assistant that has a great background in television, if I remember correctly. And so he, he's a Santa Fean. He left uh, to LA, worked with the studios there. He is back with us now. And uh, we think that we're really gonna be able to promote a lot of things that we could not get off the ground just to the, the lack of manpower. I just wanna say, if Madam President, um, members of the board and Superintendent Chavez, uh, I have been a PIO and Mr. Donarski is a much better PIO than I ever was, so kudos to him. Um, the other thing that was on our last list, and I'm just trying to see, I don't think I'm missing it here. Um, it, was, it was listed as community outreach and development of partnerships. And I know that a lot of that is embedded in what you're doing. Um, I'm thinking also just of the message that the board priorities list sends. I would appreciate us sort of putting back, you know, community engagement, outreach, and, and, and partnerships 
um, I think that was a good one. And um, I don't think we'll lose it if it's not on the board priorities list, but I guess I do feel I would like it to be on the board priorities list. Great. And, and it's underway starting this summer. Yes. That's good stuff. And it has been underway for a long time, as we're saying. Um, but, you know, there is definitely, and again, this is one of those COVID opportunities in a way that people have um, an appreciation for schools and public schools in, in particular in, you know, a way that they probably haven't in a generation, at least. And so, you know, using that plus the simple, simple wisdom that schools surrounded and supported by their community and valued um, and that sort of relationship has to go both ways. So, okay. Anything else on board priorities? Um, on the budget process and milestones, I guess, you know, as a point of privilege, I'd like to request that we, um, that you extend an invitation and, and maybe even just scheduling options for everybody to do some, um, whether two by two um, and then one, however it'll go, meetings on the budget to go in depth. I would, um, I guess there's not a lot. I am uncomfortable that we will not see our whole budget until the night we're being asked to consider adopting it. So hoping that we can figure out how to, um, go over the whole thing with a fine tooth comb before May 19th. Um, and, you know, if not whatever advance we can have on, on the, well, yeah, no, let's go with that. We'll go with plan A. Um, with uh, ideally as much in terms of the materials and, you know, because some of this, it really does help to get a little more time to stare at it all <laughs> um, and, and see different things in rather dense charts. Um, anything else on the budget process and milestone states? Uh, Madam President, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, just to piggyback off of that, um, maybe also extending an invitation to our uh, local delegation as we discussed in the past. Thank you. Yes, May 19th is the one they should come to. Great idea, thank you, Secretary Bose. Okay, anything else on the budget? This is a great start, thank you. And this is, the, this is the complicated part of the budget. The others, you know, because of the work at the CRC, the capital budget is somewhat done, the debt service is somewhat fixed, the uh, transportation and, and student nutrition, but you know, all of it, 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 and it's worth seeing how it ties all together, but there's, all, there's more flex in the operational budget, and, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the hardest part to prepare. So <laughs> they've made great progress, and um, thank you very much for this. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, moving on to our next presentation, standards-based instruction and grading. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the board. Um, taking us through tonight is a team um, leading off. Tonight is Deputy Superintendent Vanessa Romero, Assistant Superintendents Kathy Casals, Michael Hagley, and Mr. Carl Morano. And also with us tonight is Mr. David Holden, CEO of American Alliance for Innovation Systems. And he is the one we are partnering to make this transition to standards-based instruction and grading. Ms. Romero. Uh, thank you, President Noble, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. We're really excited uh, to come here tonight just to give you um, an idea of where we are. We presented in the fall and we did invite David and it was a Zoom meeting and that was our initial um, look at job embedded professional development and that was with school sites. Uh, and we just want to give you an update on the progress and where we are right now. I also want to uh, thank uh, Peter McWain, the executive director for um, CNI, because he has been so supportive to schools as we moved in this effort with standards-based instruction and grading. Um, just to go back, we've mentioned this before, we want to highlight 
um, some of our existing challenges um, as we were going through the pandemic. Teachers, <coughs> excuse me, uh, were reporting <clears throat> that they felt pressured to cover all the material rather than teaching for mastery of important concepts. Grades were focused on task completion or behavior rather than um, really understanding the, the goal. Um, and students who fell behind had difficulty recovering. And during the pandemic, um, Superintendent Chavez and I worked with site principals in looking at our grading practices and, and really looking at traditional grading practices and um, is it equitable to be giving kids zeros uh, for missing work because a lot of our kids were supporting their family during the pandemic. So those conversations started that very, very first semester of the pandemic. And it, this is also a way of addressing equity across our district for all subgroups, for our EL students, for our special education students, because with standards-based instruction, we're ensuring that students um, are taught at grade level standard rather than teaching below. Um, many times we, we hear of students that maybe are special ed or they're English language learners, and there's a need to teach one or two grade levels below the, their standard, their grade level standard, but with standards-based teaching and learning, we're ensuring that um, there's equity across the board, across the district for all of our students. Um, in working with principals and district staff and the learning that we've taken from David Holden and his team, um, we've identified four core beliefs and these core beliefs are that Santa Fe Public Schools wants the best for its students. All students can grow and learn regardless of their background or where they come from. Teacher ex expertise has a direct impact on student growth and learning. And it's a, a mind shift that teachers do have the capacity and the skill to, to build kids. And standards raise equity uh, for every for of education for everyone so we feel that this is um, one piece to addressing equity in in the district I will turn it over to mr. David Holden he's going to speak to traditional grading practices versus standards based grading and some of the work he's been doing in our schools <clears throat> thank you deputy superintendent uh, good evening, Board President Noble, and members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, as well as Santa Fe Public Schools Central Office staff and members of the audience. I just wanted to give you all some love as well. It's good to see you all in person versus uh, Zoom. And uh, I was really happy to see the board, one of the board priorities had to do with equity because at the heart of standards-based grading, it really is about equity. And what we've been doing, and when I say we, I'm talking about education across the country. What we've been doing for a long time is emphasizing compliance, telling kids that school is about doing what I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, and if you follow my rules, you'll be fine. And the rest of the world really doesn't value that. I mean, they do value responsibility and integrity and things like that, but they also value, do you know stuff, <laughs> right? Do, have you learned what you needed to learn and can you think critically? And that's one of the key differences between traditional grading systems versus standards-based grading systems. The other um, aspect of equity that connects to standards-based grading is that depending on your zip code, a lot of that um, has to do with if you live over here, you get one level of education sometimes. If you live over there, you get a different level of education uh, because you either are of the haves or the have-nots or you are with a more experienced educator or, or there's just too much variation going on. When we standardize uh, what kids are expected to learn, um, we raise the quality of education for everyone. We, we actually increase teacher knowledge and capacity by doing so because now the conversation is when, when teachers get together to discuss uh, instructional design, they're focused on um, improving their practice, their learning with and from each other versus just kind of coming up with ways to keep kids compliant. It, it's, um, I've seen it in my own 
uh, school, when I was a classroom teacher, when I was a uh, district leader, and I'm seeing it with the clients that I work with across the country, and I'm really super proud to be associated with Santa Fe Public Schools in their efforts. Um, you, what you're doing with standards-based grading is you are building a system in which, regardless of the changes that happen uh, in education, and they happen frequently, you are no, you're going to have a system, a, a group of educators across the district that can respond effectively to any changes in, in policy and standards um, without lowering expectations for, for students. Um, I wrote a couple of specific notes. I was just speaking from the heart right there. So, you know, um, now, okay. now I'm actually going to go to my prepared remarks. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm passionate about this because I've seen it change lives. So I just wanted to get my, my passion out there for a second. And, and Mr. Holden, you're familiar with Santa Fe Public Schools. Yes, yes. Um, for I, I don't know how much everyone knows, but um, several years ago, um, I was uh, contacted um, by uh, one of your uh, former principals. Um, and is that what you're talking about? My, my work here? Yeah. I can't remember. That was like 2010, maybe. Um, but I was actually, I've always been involved with school improvement efforts across the country since about 2008. And in about 2010, I was contacted. Um, I think that was at Capitol High, was right there with uh, Melanie Romero, was the principal at that time. And um, I did some training on with her teachers at Capitol High on how to engage in a, a planning cycle which connected to standards-based grading. We weren't overtly addressing standards-based grading, but it had that impact of um, building teacher capacity and ensuring that the outcomes for students in all classes were going to be at minimum the same. There's no ceiling, but we established floors because right now it, across the country, it, it just it's based on what teacher you get what you're going to learn and we said nope all kids will achieve at minimum these grade level expectations and, but we're going to open up the ceiling and, and push kids as, as far as they can go um, standards based grading empowers children because feedback on traditional grading was more about what you're missing uh, you didn't turn this in whereas feedback in a standards based grading system is now here's what you're learning here's what you haven't yet learned and um, students are now able to self-assess, so we call them assessment-capable learners. And if I know what I need to know, I can, I'm now empowered to go out and learn it or uh, get help peop find people who can help me learn it. And that's what we want is these empowered individuals um, because traditional grading, the students serve our ends, our, you know, like it's, it's um, uh, do your work, turn things in, and we'll get through this. But Standards-based grading is now, it's the focus is on the student, and, and our role is to serve that student, to empower that child. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm a little nervous, so you probably see that, but it's okay. Um, the other thing that I'd like to kind of mention is when it comes to, and I think this may be on the next slide, so can we turn to the next slide for a second? Oh, I've got the clicker? I'll just do that. There we go. Look at that. Um, there's a there's several there's lots of information here um, that I kind of want to talk about. If you look at that fourth bullet that says report on academic achievement separately from behavior, the way that that connects to equity is this: if I in traditional grading, if I say the student has received a 70 for a course, none of us in this room knows exactly what that means, right? Um, it could mean that the student only knows 70 percent of the material, or it could mean that the student knows 100 percent of the material but he talks too much and he didn't clean the board and I'm going to penalize that child for not behaving the way that I want it. And it, it's just, it's too mixed up. And what happens sometimes is there are students, usually students with means, students who know how to play the game of school a little better than others, students who have greater resources that tend to get um, higher grades based on what, what's called studenting behaviors. Whereas uh, students without means, students of poverty, students who are non-native, uh, you know, to to uh, to the United States, to to here to Santa Fe, um, don't know how to play the game of school, and they they lose in that game, and so the focus isn't on learning. Um, those. I mean, I could talk deeply about each of those bullets, and, and I don't. I mean, I could go on and on. I don't want to um, to monopolize your time, but I cannot 
stress enough how standards-based grading strengthens the systems of the system of educators you have, empowers children, and brings about uh, equity. Our goal is to one of our goals is to close that achievement gap, and the way we do that is to develop systems like standards-based grading. And now everyone who comes into the organization um, now has a, a, a system in which they're, they're, they're a part of. Um, so we reduce the number of independent contractor teaching, and we now move into um, a, a system of teaching and learning that, um, th with a focus on equity. Um, yeah, that's... Um, I've, I would love to entertain any questions. I'm better when you ask, ask me questions, you know, but because I could ramble and I don't want to really ramble. I don't really ramble when I'm doing training. It's just like this is so important. And I don't know what all of you know or don't know yet. So I'm eager to kind of find out what specific questions you might have about this. Well, I think we have some. And mm -hmm. thank you for your passion. It comes through more in person, <laughs> even than on Zoom. Dr. Gonzalez. Madam President, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, I'm getting tired here, <clears throat> but are, are the elementary students going to get A to F grades? Uh, is that eliminated? Is that... Oh, oh. And the only re the reason I'm asking, I'm not that concerned about it, but often when you change things, because we all grew up, we got A to F grades, will parents and community members not like this system? Um, we are going to address that specifically in a later, we have a okay. few more slides to share, but I, I will say this, standards-based grading is primarily about the feedback that we give to children about their learning. So mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're K through 12 students, high quality feedback that is clear, um, uh, criteria driven, uh, actionable, timely, that's what it's going to be about. Um, so so how does that work for like going home with report cards or whatever? And that's going to be addressed later? Yeah, okay. it, it will be addressed later. And if it's still not clear afterwards, then we'll, we'll definitely do that. So I've been monopolized a little too much of the time. I want to get them on to the, the next I one. I think so. we have one more question oh, yes. for you, uh, Secretary Boje. At least we can, we can have more. We can keep this fluid. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez. Um, and I have specific questions about things that you said. So yes. um, I'm curious, you know, we changed math curriculum last year during the pandemic, at least in elementary. I don't know if that was in other grades. So my children went through that. And you talked about how this will um, provide structure for teachers to respond to those kinds of changes more easily. Can you explain that a little bit more, like how, th how that looks when something changes and why this is more beneficial? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I want to just preface, preface it by saying the word curriculum is something that we need to have a lar longer conversation about. Um, what I'm going to say is I'm going to refer to the, the math curriculum that you, you talked about. I'm going to refer to that as one element of the curriculum, if that's okay. So I'm going to call it a curriculum resource um, because there are more elements than just, just that. However, um, in a non-standards-based grading system, and I'm not speaking specifically to Santa Fe because I, I'm just talking, saying in general, the trend is this. Without standards-based teaching and learning and grading, when people are given an instructional resource that is very structured, we tend to become um, more automated and focused on um, implementing the resource. You know, read page one, teach page one, read page two, teach page two, so on and so forth. And we reduce our, our focus on being an instructional designer responsive to the needs of the children at any given moment. So um, when we shift to standards-based grading, we now focus on the standards. This is what children will learn, and all children can and will achieve at high levels with the appropriate amount of support. And now I know um, I can better diagnose where a child is and figure out what they still need to learn. And now I can um, manipulate the resource to figure out what I need from this resource to help that child learn. So instead of leading with the resource, I'm now leading with my knowledge of the standards, the, the criteria for success to demonstrate mastery of those standards, my ability to assess where this child is in relation to those standards, and then my knowledge of the resource to say, oh, 
this child needs X, here is where I could find X in the resource, and let me am amplify that to support the child. So that's what standards-based grading does, is it reduces the reliance upon the resource to tell me what to do, and it strength empowers me to know how to best support that child, because publishers are not child-specific, whereas we educators need to be child-specific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, and it leads right into my next question, which is, for example, you have a level three teacher who feels like they do this already. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring them into this conversation and get their buy-in on adopting a new system when they feel like it's a little bit redundant and or maybe just another way of being prescriptive about how they handle their classrooms? Standards-based grading isn't necessarily prescriptive. Um, it, it's, we agree that this is what children will learn, but we don't necessarily have to conform to, we, don't, we can get them there in a variety of ways. Um, so as long as that teacher in, in this scenario is committed to w working to get all of those children to, at minimum, meet proficiency of the standard, um, then we're open to having a conversation about different techniques that, that might, might work. As long as they follow you know, district policies related to those techniques, um, there's multiple pathways, um, but one minimum destination that, that we're going towards. Thank you. Yeah. And now I'd like to introduce <laughs> Kathy Casaus. <laughs> President Noble, board members, and Superintendent Chavez. Um, I want to take a moment to give you kind of an idea or a definition of a term you're going to be hearing a lot as we move forward. And that is, oh, next slide, please. Oh, I have it. Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. And that is the proficiency scale. And that kind of wraps up everything we've been talking about. It's basically a table that will have numbers, the one, two, three, four, and it's going to have the description of what we want our kids to know and understand when we know they've got that standard. Then it's gonna have the other levels of where they might be. And the kids will be able to use these proficiency scales to, be, to say, for instance, I'm right here, I'm at a two, because I need to know and understand these things to get to a three. It's also helping the teacher give feedback to the student um, about where they need to go to build up. So it wraps up helping our kids understand the expectations. It gives all of our teachers that same, again, back to equity, where we've got the same idea of where we want and understand our kids need to be to understand the, um, the standard. And you all asked earlier, are our teachers going to be able to work together? They have been. They've been building these proficiency scales over the last year. They're completing them. In our training from June 6th to 9th, they will, our goal and our intention is to have a proficiency, proficiency scale for every grade level, for every priority standard, so that our teachers have those ready to go in August. And this is wrapping up what we will use as we move forward in the grading. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we just wanna add that you can see up on this slide that we created three different pathways for the 2022-2023 school year before we go full implementation. We wanted to uh, get a gauge for where site principals are in this um, progress because we didn't wanna force anybody into any kind of pathway. Depending on where they are with their staffs and instructional leaders, we uh, sent out a survey a few months ago to see where everybody was at. And this kind of led us to uh, decide, uh, as you can see the three pathways for, for the next school year. Pathway one is, um, fully going implementation with reporting by standards in power school and using a proficiency scale. Pathway two is kind of middle of the road there, just using a proficiency scale. And then pathway three, uh, those are schools that still need a lot of PLC support and implementing our seven step cycle. So um, you can see the schools that are 
going to take this on for next school year, this was based on that survey. All of our current professional development is geared to these certain pathways. Today we just had a, a, a professional development for our pathway two and pathway three schools. Tomorrow we'll have another uh, full day of professional development for our pathway one school. So we're gearing our professional development to where they're at right now and that'll help them um, go through the next school year um, using these uh, different skills. So. And part of the, P, uh, the PD yeah. that's going on is building capacity from within, building instructional leaders at every single site. They are doing the work and they're doing the training of other teachers. Uh, the principals are providing that, that support, but it really is peer to peer if you wanna uh, look at it that way, teacher to teacher providing that support and training. And I just wanna elaborate on the seven step cycle. That's really identifying standards, looking at the standard, breaking it down to a priority standard, then going through it and seeing what is the learning targets for that standard, then building success criteria, and then adjusting after you assess, right? If the student, you know, David alluded to it a little bit, um, if the student gets it, then we can actually advance them a little more. If the student is still not um, reaching that standard, what can we do to uh, help uh, get that student to where they need to go? And Mr. Morano, I just want to add, the teachers are doing this work. Yep. You know, it's school site specific. And so at these PDs, it's their school leaders. So Ramirez Thomas has their instructional team. Uh, El Dorado has their instructional team. So they're doing it as a collaborative effort. Board Member Anderson. Thank you, Board President Noble, members of the Board, Superintendent Chavez. If I have a question about Power School, should I ask it now or wait? Okay. We, we, got, we got have it. that. A Perfect. lot of questions about grading and Excellent. yeah, it'll be coming up. So. Good evening, Board President Noble, members of the Board, Superintendent Chavez. Power School. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we knew that we had some work to do in terms of figuring out how Power School was going to help support uh, our standards-based grading work. And we uh, formed a task force earlier in, in the year, in January, of, of 25 members, including teachers from all levels, uh, district staff from curriculum and instruction, from technology, as well as uh, site administrator, administrators, uh, to learn about the functionality of Power School related to standards-based grading. We sent representatives to training in uh, December, a December Power School University training that was a week-long uh, virtual training, uh, and several sessions were specific to standards-based grading, as well as a team that went to a training in January, again, to Power School University um, to learn uh, specifically the full breadth of functionality with, with Power School and standards-based grading. Fortunately, we are not the first district to work with Power School and ask these questions about standards-based grading, and they have established a, um, a, a robust system of functionality within, within their system that we can leverage. Um, we have had the ability uh, within our district and our technology office to set up a, a separate server a test server which created a, a sandbox uh, that our uh, uh, task force was able to play in. And so we became familiar with the different settings that were present in uh, Power School and we tested different scenarios. We set up different grade scales, we turned things on, turned things off, and uh, did testing over the course of the semester and uh, as a task force came to some recommendations for teaching and learning of how we wanted to move forward for next year. We're going to keep the task force together moving into next year because we want to be able to have that circular feedback um, for, for us to be able to come together and say, what's working? What are some things we might want to consider tweaking for the following year? So we're keeping that dialogue and conversation open with, uh, with PowerSchool. And moving on with, with uh, the same theme, just the last couple of slides here, uh, this is just an example of what a standards-based grade book might look like. And this is not the exact format for PowerSchool, but you'll notice a couple things that may be different than what you might be used to seeing in a, in a standard grade book. 
One, there's specific reference to the skills that are being assessed with the students. So rather than seeing um, chapter seven quiz, chapter seven test, homework for Monday, homework for Tuesday, and so on and so on, you see that the students are working on writing equations from graphs. And how are they doing on writing equations from graphs? They have a specific uh, score next to that skill. So the gradebook becomes really more about skills and uh, clearly communicating how students are doing on the standards that they're working on uh, rather than just uh, communicating a completion of, of homework or tasks. Completion of homework or tasks can still be communicated in the gradebook and in fact it's often delineated between practice and standard and so you'll see in this gradebook there are several items that are listed as practice and some of those items may or may not be graded they may be marked as collected with the check mark or they may be marked as missing with the exclamation point or they may be graded and if they're graded they may or may not be included in the final grade and those those kinds of decisions uh, would still be up to the teacher to make um, and you can see the assessment key on the lower right hand corner this is a really big shift for us being able to be accurate and specific with the numerical feedback we're giving to students i think somebody mentioned earlier if we have a 70 percent on an assignment what does 70 percent mean what does 71 percent mean what's the difference between 70 percent and 71 percent on a four point scale we're able to clearly communicate a three means this and we're going to list these three indicators under a three for performance if you can meet these three indicators or these three success criteria you are at a level of three performance if you're at a two you might be uh, reaching one or two of those if you're at a four you've reached all of the grade level um, expectations for that standard but you've gone more deeply into that standard or you've been able to apply your knowledge of that standard to other unique uh, s s situations or scenarios and last slide if I can get to it okay so this is where we talk about whether students are receiving numbers or letters for their final grades and so the task force has had determined in our conversations that we would like to align numbers and letters to when students are required to or when we're st st uh, required to begin reporting eligibility and GPA and when we begin to assemble transcripts uh, high school transcripts for students college entrance and so for grades K through 6 we will provide uh, number feedback similar to how we do in grades K through 12 now and once students reach uh, grade 7 and continuing grades 7 through 12 students will still receive number feedback on those specific assessments that we saw on the previous screen and in their grade book they will see numbers those 4321 scores next to the standards and skills that they're learning so they'll have that clear understanding of where, where they're at in each of those skills those numbers at the uh, as a final course grade will then be converted to for the seventh through twelfth graders a letter grade that uh, carries with it the GPA score that that we're all used to an A would be a 4.0 score for GPA a B would be a 3.0 score for GPA and we would be able to produce uh, transcripts that uh, colleges would know how to read where we started with this conversion process is identifying for us what does an A mean for us as a school district and the task force decided that for us right now an A means that a student has uh, completed proficient or advanced work on all of the course essential standards and what does a B mean a B is a student has completed proficient work on almost all course essential standards and so you can see those descriptors down there starting at the left hand side of the chart uh, the numer uh, numerical scores that the student receives for their standards their standard scores 
reflecting on their uh, skills, their proficiency level on the skills. Those will be averaged together to create the raw score in PowerSchool. And PowerSchool will give us a real-time translation into the letter grades that you see on the right-hand side. Parents will still, in grades 7 through 12, be able to see at any time the real current final grade for a course in the form of a letter grade. And they will be able to click on that letter grade and see the standards and skills themselves broken down. So they will be able to see um, where if a student is at a proficiency in skill A, if they're nearing proficiency in skill B, if they're advanced in skill C. And so parents will have more information uh, uh, available to them. And there's another view in PowerSchool that also gives you all of the standards that the child is working on regardless of which course it is because some standards overlap between some courses. So um, all of the information that we have available to us now in PowerSchool as parents and as students will continue to be available plus the additional information of, of having the uh, skill proficiency levels broken down by skill. And this is really important for a student who might have a 70% in the class and wants to get an 80% or a 90%. And up until this time, the only way to do that often is to ask for extra credit. What, what more work do I have to do to get my grade up to an 80% or a 90%? Now the question can be, I see that in skill two, I'm nearing proficient. How can I show you that I'm proficient in skill three. And that's a much different conversation and, and similar to what Mr. Holden was talking about, students taking ownership of their learning. And we heard today in the training a lot of examples given by teachers about the excitement they had when they first had a student that, that had that shift where the student was understanding what they were learning, they understood what they needed to do to show that they had that they had gotten there and, and they were taking ownership in their, in their learning. I want to add, Mr. Hagley, it also provides transparency. Um, and board member Anderson, I asked my team uh, every time I get a chance, how does PowerSchool look? <laughs> so we're on the same page. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, if I can just add to a comment you made earlier, uh, schools are currently uh, having um, nights to help inform their parents, their school community, and students on what to look for, on t how to uh, access this, and what to expect. Amy Bill had a, a great success last night, and they had over 100, if I remember correctly, uh, parents and students attending this night to really understand it. And the teachers led the discussion. It was not led by the principal. Madam President, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Chavez, <clears throat> Uh, in case I didn't make it clear, my team and I provide technical training to schools and districts on how to do this work, and, it's, and we have all done this work in our respective districts. I just want to tell you a story. Um, there's a school in upstate New York. Um, I'm not going to go into the specific school, but uh, we were working there several years ago, and for the purposes of this story, it, it's relevant. They were 17% um, African American students. but an overrepresentation of African American students in special education and in uh, all of the negative categories, uh, you know, s suspension, so on and so forth. And it was about 63% roughly, um, which is vastly different than 17%. And then in the higher level coursework, there were about maybe almost 5% in advanced placement and, and other types of high level coursework. Now, I'm not saying that it should always be a one-to-one -one correlation, right? Because um, that would be silly. But 63% is extremely high and 5% is extremely low in, in that advanced coursework. What we learned was um, because they were not on standards-based grading, they, were, they had gatekeepers in place for students who didn't behave the way that they thought they should behave. And um, I was talking with a young man, uh, an African-American student, and after I, I talked to him, it was just clear that he was in super intelligent, genius. I don't know why he's not going to win the Pulitzer Prize. I mean, he was just that special to me. And uh, then I asked um, the, the woman who was the gatekeeper for her advanced placement course, and she said that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, 
the way he communicates was too street. And, um, you know, he says ain't and whatnot and hanging with his homies and things like that. And I said, well, what about his ideas? What about his demonstration of understanding the curriculum and everything like that? And she was focused more on whether or not his behavior conformed to her perceptions of the ideal student behavior. And that was extremely <laughs> inequitable. And um, I, I did all I could not to just yell in rage at that moment. Um, we worked with that school over a couple of years to help them transition to a standards-based planning system and standards-based grading system and reporting and going back to those proficiency scales uh, that, um, that were mentioned earlier, they now, in order to get into advanced placement, you have to demonstrate proficiency on a certain set of skills that they all agree upon. So there's no more gatekeepers, and there's an increase in, uh, in equity and access to the curriculum. So I just wanted to say that that is what standards-based grading does for, ch for families. So thank you for that. Mr. McGinnis, you had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering how standards-based learning impacts um, AP programs. I was wondering how that impacts weighting and where the, where the standards are coming from or if they're just directly from College Board. Uh, Do you want me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I have to say that I'm so impressed with your team here because I've never been in a room where executives at this level could all articulate about standards-based grading. So I'm just, I have to give a shout out to them. Um, your question, excellent question. Um, first of all, we, uh, and I'm speaking in, in general, I'm not speaking on behalf as a uh, policymaker here in the district, but our general approach is that we honor the uh, expectations of the College Board uh, so there's no um, diminishing of those expectations. Um, so whatever uh, the expectations College Board has of advanced placement students, those stay in, in place. What we do encourage is teachers of the same AP, AP classes to get together and still go through similar processes, but with through the lens of AP expectations, right? So, so that's kind of like the, the general approach. And the more that I work with uh, your team here and the teachers here, um, the more I, I become familiar with current practices, I will gear all of my training to, to respect that. But generally, we do not diminish the expectations of any specific course like advanced placement. Okay. And, I, I, and Mr. McGinnis, we have AP teachers participating in these planning groups. So they are involved and uh, they are working collaboratively across the board. Thank you. Well, and um, with a video and I think Cody can help us with this, but this just exemplifies and demonstrates what standards-based grading is. It's providing actionable and immediate feedback to students. It's maintaining rigor, um, and it's tied specifically to a, to a task or a skill. And this is a first grade student, and he is completing an art assignment, but he's getting feedback from the teacher, and he's getting feedback from his peers. What would you oh. guys say to teachers, Second, I thought they if they're talking. not getting high quality work, could they learn something from this? And what would you say to them that they could do differently in their classrooms? This is a story called Austin's Butterfly. And it's a true story about a first grade boy, and his name is Austin, and he goes to school, or used to go to school, in a town called Boise, Idaho. And in his class in Boise, Idaho, they were studying butterflies, and he had to do a project his job in first grade was to draw a butterfly, and this is the butterfly that he picked. Austin had to use this photograph as his model, and he had to draw an accurate scientific drawing of this butterfly. This is called a tiger swallowtail. I knew it! Did, can you tell Toby why it's called tiger? Because it kind of has the stripes of the tiger yeah. right there. Good. So here was Austin's job. He was supposed to do a scientific drawing of that butterfly. But remember, Austin was only in first grade. And you know what he did? He forgot to look like a scientist carefully. He got his paper, and he just started to draw the image of a butterfly that he had in his head. 
And he wasn't looking like a scientist, and so this is what he drew. Whoa. It's not bad, and it is a butterfly, but does it look exactly like this? No. No, it doesn't yet. It doesn't look exactly like this yet. And so they didn't look at this and say, good, Austin, you're done. They said, Austin, good start. Now we can start giving you critiques so you can do a second draft and make it better, and a third draft and make it better, and you can make it much, much closer to this, and he was ready to go. All of the first graders in his critique group sat on the floor like you guys are, and they decided to split their advice into two kinds. First, just the shape of the wings. And then when the shape was right, they give him advice about the pattern inside the wings. Alia, what would you say? You can make it much pointier. Good. These wings could be much pointier. Who else would add something? Atak, what would you say? How about the angle, because not to be mean about yes. the angle, it's just not exact, so... Um... Okay, so show me. Come on up here, Atak. Show me where, what you would ask him to do slightly differently. Um, like to make it a little longer. Longer where? Draw like, where you would do it. Right there. Okay, so pull this out longer. Yeah. That's very specific, Atak. Thank you. Jamila, what would you say? It's like, like, uh, triangle. Good. Jamila, I love that. So you're saying more like a triangle shape. And I agree. Well, you know what? Those first graders came up with most of those same ideas. And you know what Austin said? He said, okay, I'll go try. And he went back to his seat and he drew this. Does this look more like a triangle? Yeah. Yeah. Did he go out further, like Atak was suggesting? Yes. Yeah. Did he add some jaggedness here? Yes. Like Cindy, did he get rid of that bottom thing? Yes. So he did listen to his friends, and he made it better. It's not perfect. Toby, what would you say? I'd say don't put those little tail things so pointed in. I'd say put them more pointed down. Good. Okay, and Ethan, what would you say? Um, I think you should make the wings like this, not like this. Like okay, that. he listened to his friends and they said, this is really a lot better, Austin. That second draft really is better. Yeah, maybe he can make a third one. Good, maybe he could make a third draft. Yeah. And so he did this draft. That's his third draft. That's his third draft, Hadley. That's just right. Elijah, what do you notice there? Well, one wing's more pointed than the other, and that side is a little bit higher than the other. Good. Coburn? Um, right here, it doesn't have the inside thing still. Ah, okay. Needs a little bit more of that notch. So, do you think maybe he should do a fourth draft? Yeah. Well, that's just what he said. He said, shoot, okay. I got round again. I'll go back and do a fourth draft. He listened. He listened. Does it look more even like Elijah was suggesting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And does it look like it's coming out a little sharper, like yes. Cindy was suggesting? And like Attack was saying, it's a little, the angle is, looks a little better. So now Austin was feeling really good. He said, am I ready to add some pattern? And they said, OK, why don't you try adding some of the pattern? And he did. Oh, he's good at it. He is so good. And then they said, Austin, you're ready for color. Let's look at his last draft. Wow. And what do you think? Did it come out really good? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about how much progress he made? And Tak, what would you say about his progress? He made like a lot of progress. He persevered doing it. His friends were honest with him. What was it about the kinds of advice that they gave that allowed him to get better each time? Hassan? Well, they told him what was wrong about it. Did they say it's just wrong, or were they more specific? Than they were more specific, but they weren't mean about it. Great. Hadley? He made six drafts. And so is that, a, is that something that other kids should learn from? What, yeah. we learn, what should we learn from that? We can make other drafts if it's not right. Good. So if you can keep, if it's not right, you can keep doing more drafts to make it better. You just don't use the things in your head. You want to use a um, sharp eye. Good. He used the eyes of a scientist. Great. All right. Thank you. And that just exemplifies that we, if we give 
feedback, if we allow our kids multiple opportunities, they, they do reach grade level standard in, in any area. So we stand for more questions, if there are any. Madam President. Go ahead, Secretary Wesley. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, superintendent. I just wanted to share an anecdotal story. Uh, my first grader is at El Dorado, and um, I suppose maybe his teacher's just trying some of this on, mm -hmm. and his last few spelling tests that they do on Fridays have had number grades on them, and at the bottom, he is putting three, and then for four, practice the challenge questions, and so he's coming home and saying, this is, this is what's next, this is what's next, and he's really excited about it, and the other thing that I don't, I may be starting to think that this is where it came from, is that he's using the word satisfying, like when he's working. This is very satisfying. <laughs> like I give him a chore and he's like, this is very satisfying. And so I think, you know, it's really, we all know how much I love things to be standardized. So this is really exciting for me. And I think that um, it'll be really reinforcing for kids to, to see that progress in that way and that it's really a demonstration of what they know and not just checking something off. Thank you so much Thank for you. the presentation. Thank you. Uh, board President Noble. Go ahead. Thank you, President Noble, uh, members of the board and Superintendent Chavez. I just have a couple of questions. Um, so one of the things that this like sort of sparked in me when I was listening to it is um, how applicable it is for neurodivergent learners, specifically people who struggle with executive function. Um, so when I was looking at the power school um, example, you know, the exclamation points mm -hmm. sort of stood out to me. And I wondered like if a student maybe has that neurodivergence and struggles with executive function and struggles with paper and turning in assignments mm -hmm. and things like that, but demonstrates uh, an understanding of the skill, is that reflected in the in the final number? Uh, board member Anderson, we have talked about if they can't write a paper or have a presentation, how else are we looking at that child and saying, yes, you know what, they were able to stand up there and share a story. So that is their mastery of the standard. Okay. And of course, if, if a child has an IEP and looking at those, sta those mm -hmm. IEP skills as right. well. But yes, providing multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency and not just, oh, we're completing a paper or you have to complete a presentation. Okay, great. I don't even know if kids use paper anymore. School, but. <laughs> or type. <laughs> or yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and then um, I see like this, this this is amazing. I mean, it's just truly amazing. I wish I could go back to school. I mean, this is just so exciting. Forget my kids. I want to go back. Um, <laughs> but um, then I also hear, for example, what President Mayer was saying about state assessments. And those don't seem to me to fit exactly into what we're doing. Um, so a couple of questions. Will we continue doing things like short cycle assessments, like ice station and things like that? Um, will students continue to practice those things? I know sometimes mm -hmm. there's more ice station practice in one classroom than in another. Mm -hmm. um, and then is it possible to, does the state allow us to design our own assessments or figure out ways mm -hmm. that we can meet, you know, um, the different standards that the federal government and the state government have for us in ways that align more with standards-based instruction so I will start with unfortunately we do have to continue with ice stations and uh, IMSA and the SAT for for our high school kids I will say that a lot of teachers in doing this work have been utilizing common formative assessments or short cycle assessments to gauge student learning um, when we were getting together as teams and deciding like what are the priority standards going to be for a third grader fifth grader whatever the grade level we did look at state assessments and, and kind of looked at those big um, standards and included them in our priority standards so that we are hitting them during the year and hopefully the focus of let's practice how to get on a computer and let's practice ice stations, hopefully that will go away because 
we've identified priority standards that not all of them, but that are the big rocks in state assessments. And that should help address, um, you know, learning loss, accelerate the learning, and really help them be successful on those uh, assessments. And then just that second part, which is, is it possible for us to have different assessments than mm -hmm. what gets state. kind of handed down by Pearson? I don't know. Is that, no, that's nothing. <laughs> we can't. Yeah, we can't, we can't do a portfolio. We, we don't have that flexibility. Okay. I'll with write gradu my, I'll write with my graduation <laughs> requirements, we do because mm -hmm. we okay. do have a board poli policy that addresses that. Okay. So we are uh, piloting the capstone project, and okay. that is really about uh, work-based learning, capstone projects, um, okay. portfolio work. Okay. So we are piloting different uh, methods mm -hmm. to meet graduation requirements, but mm -hmm. that's again at the secondary level, and it really is in alignment with the board policy. Okay, great. I will write my legislators about that. So, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding, but um, <laughs> I am trying to make a joke. So thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. And I will just end. The teachers have been amazing during this school year. Um, and going back to the level three teachers, experienced teachers, um, we made it an effort and principals have made it an effort to include them in their leadership teams uh, and as part of this work so that they are the experts that go back to their school sites and share it and facilitate those conversations. So um, principals have been very mindful about ensuring that, that level three teachers or people that are interested get on board and, and push this work at their school sites. Thank you. And I want to thank the team because everybody has been working extremely hard. And I just have one question on the numbers. We, the whole range between like three and four will be used for grades? Because obviously there's a bigger range for an A and a D and an F than there is for a B and a C. So pres numerically. President Noble, we are going to be using that numeric value, but as I said, or as Michael said, we have the task force mm -hmm. that's going to be looking at this through next school year in case we need to make adjustments. And Michael, I'll let you add if you have any. Uh, and the teachers would be able to differentiate. Are you asking when they're grading an assignment whether they could give a 3 or a 3.5 or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, they will be able to do that as long as they can define what a 3.5 is in, in relation to a 3. Yeah. And that's the and so yeah. Yeah. And so that's where they, they, when they develop that proficiency scale, the level 1 has a narrative language that describes what a level 1 looks like. Level 2, what, what does a level 2 look like in 3 and 4 and so on. And so they could insert a 3.5. And, um, and describe that for the students as well. But the point is that they're communicating that ahead of time to the students so that the students know what the goal is that they're working toward. And the task force will continue to work on this. That reduces implicit bias. And, and that reduces implicit bias because yeah. without these scales, my bias will factor into my assessment. And totally. again, going back to equity, um, so just wanted to put a plug in for that. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much, Mr. Holden. Thank you for coming to see us in person. Really appreciate that. Um, and Deputy Superintendent, I think this is the third, maybe fourth time you've brought something on standards-based grading before the board, and it's really exciting to see it developing and that we're really going to have it working next year. That is just thrilling. Thank you all for your work. This is incredible stuff. And, you know, talk about reimagining. <laughs>
just to say, I, I thought it might be good for us to come through, to come together and talk about the budget um, next week. Um, and we can do individual meetings in addition or instead of, does anybody have any strong feelings as to whether we should ask for a study session next week? I feel like if we're doing the individual meetings or the two and two meetings, which I feel like might be helpful actually to have a couple of people in the room if it's possible. I know one person will be, and I'm happy to be that person, <laughs> but um, but I feel like that, if scheduling works out, but I feel like doing that might be more like enough to get us to where we need to be. Okay. I, I don't know if anybody else. I'm not trying to duck out of a meeting, but I No, feel it's, it's fine, and my concern is that I always learn things from other people's questions. True, is, true. Is just that, and, and doing it together um, might be all right, but... I agree. I feel the same about other people's questions. Okay. So at this stage, I think we will um, not plan on the finance subcommittee next week. We'll plan on the individual meetings um, and doing them in pairs um, and with an odd person out. And I am also happy to be that odd person out. I've done a few of these, um, although it's a little different than um, I've seen it before, which is fine. It probably increases the resilience to look at things in different formats. Um, but we do have a CRC and audit committee meetings next week. And then, you know, and just to be clear, we will be asked to adopt the budget. We don't have to. We will need to add a special meeting if we don't adopt it on um, the 19th. So that's where we are. And then lots of graduations, and, and that's the, that is a slight concern for me, is that if we do need, I can do a million if-then scenarios, but maybe I'm too tired. Um, oh, it's not that bad. It's only Santa Fe High that's on that Thursday. <laughs> okay. It'll be a long day for everybody if we do need a special meeting on Thursday the 26th. Anything else on advanced planning? Anything else at all? Okay, thank you all very much.